She won't take to it well. So you expect me to stay away and wait until she's gone? I nearly laugh. If Vori thinks I'm scared of my sister, he's wrong. I don't fear Faina. I care about her and want to see her happy. Perhaps if he'd adopt this notion toward his own family, he'd be closer to us all. I expect you to do as I've told you, he snaps, clearly angry at my amusement. Your dismissal isn't only about Faina. Your men are loyal. But it's still not been proven whether their loyalty is to this family or... He pauses, disgust and anger sweeping through his features. Or if their loyalty is only to you. And Clara, what happens when Faina is gone? The two are close. Will you be taking the girl? She stays, he carelessly replies. Vinyamin will need her company once his aunt is gone. Mark is too old to handle him alone. And perhaps Vinyamin can use Clara in ways both Faina and Mark would not approve. Vori, I warn closing my eyes and expelling every ounce of energy I can gather to stay seated. Veniamen is a child. Clara is a woman. I don't include that in all regards, whether I know what to do with her or not, she's mine. Drilling his gaze to mine, his lips thin. The knuckles of the hand holding his glass turn white. Venomously he spits. She is a woman who means nothing. Which I'll remind you is what she'll always be to you. She stays, if only so you remember that. 19. Clara You have nothing at all to say about any of this? I interrogate Ruan, who continues holding his concentration to the road ahead. Tell me why you won't talk to me. Three days ago, I watched V walk out of the house alone, which is something he rarely does. I had no idea where he was going, but if the size of his suitcase was an indication, he wouldn't be back for a while. When I asked Venny where he'd gone, he carefully considered my question. He almost didn't answer, but I pushed until he finally did. He told me V went to his cabin. For two weeks, Ruan has been ignoring me completely. He's hardly so much as looked in my direction. Since he's the only one of these men who's near my age, I always thought he and I shared a special kinship in a life beyond our control. With Faina gone again, Mug busy keeping the house in order, and Venny out running with his friends, I already felt betrayed by V and then, ultimately, alone. After a few hours of contemplation, I marched into Ruan's room, suitcase in hand, and told him where I intended to go. I needed a way to get there. I could have driven myself, but I didn't want to risk getting stuck in the middle of nowhere. It was after I laid out my plan when Ruan finally looked at me like he always has. His eyes were wide, and he did a poor job of hiding their smile in them. Ruan, I hiss, folding my arms across my chest. If you don't tell me why you're so angry with me, I'll ask Abram. Still, he says nothing. Or Leonid, or Gleb. I try next. I bet one of them will tell me, all you boys gossip like girls. You say you don't, but I know you do. Ruan continues his studious gaze out the windshield, but I catch a small lift at the corner of his lips. Fine, I nearly give in, but add, V will know. He slams on the brakes, and my hand darts out to hold the dashboard. Panicked, Ruan reaches across his seat to mine. Once he puts the car back in motion, he finally, finally, after so many days of silence, starts to explain his position. Vlad had a word with me, Clara, and it wasn't a nice one. A word? Nodding but not looking in my direction, he adds, I was told to stay out of your way. Clearly not understanding, my eyebrows furrow before my eyes narrow. He uses my confused silence as an opportunity to continue in dramatic detail. I like my hands, both of them, and I'm partial to keeping all my fingers, he jokingly admits. Vlad threatened to slowly cut each of them off if I got near you without him being in the same room. You're joking, 
I whisper, anger boiling. Stop it. No, Ruan denies, a sudden civility in his voice. Really, Vlad means what he says, so you coming to my room telling me what you were going to do without anyone else knowing? I'm so sorry, I inject. I couldn't let you go alone. He'd kill me for that, too. I hadn't realized my insistence in having Ruan take me to V would be putting him in... What? Danger? A V? Surely V wouldn't... Answering the question I didn't ask aloud, Ruan interrupts. He would. He'd do whatever the hell he felt he had to do to keep me away from you. That's crazy, I exclaim, if only to myself. You're not... I mean, you and me... Calm down, woman, before you swallow your tongue. It's okay. It is not okay, I cry again, this time louder. He has no right. You've done nothing wrong. Still, so even and cool, Ruan returns. He has every right. Even if we... I blush, words sticking in my throat. I mean, if we... We'll never, he mockingly finishes. So, it's a moot point. No longer boiling in clouded anger, I'm now enraged and completely furious. I don't have many friends. I don't have any true family. For V to threaten someone I love and trust as both, and do it for no real reason, infuriates me. Collecting myself as best I can, I ask with eerie calmness, Ruan, do you by chance have a gun in here? A gun? Yes, in here, with you, a gun. Clara, you know I'm required to carry one. Why are you asking? Because I don't think I can smother V myself. I'm going to shoot him instead. Turning my head with furious tears burning my eyes, I met with Ruan's undeniable boyish smirk. The look of his relief does nothing to assuage the irritation burning me from the inside out. The jerk! An hour and thirty minutes later, Ruan parks his car next to the black town car V took as he was leaving. This is where I drop you off, he tells me. I can't chance helping you inside and still come out breathing. Thank you, Ruan. I'm so sorry. Lifting his hand between us, he leaves the other on the steering wheel and shakes his head. Go to him, Clara. Even he'll get why I disobeyed if it was to keep you safe. I really didn't know he talked to you. I tell him, still feeling a small pang of guilt for forcing Ruan to do something against orders from V. I got that, now go, he pushes, while I still have a chance to get away. Grabbing the door handle and taking a deep breath for courage, I nod my goodbye. The cabin isn't anything that I'd expected it to be. In fact, it's hardly a cabin at all. If the outside weren't shrouded by trees, the location set far off the beaten path, and the building itself built of logs. I would consider this more of a luxurious vacation home. I turn the heavy handle of the wooden door and step inside. Nothing about the main room shares a woman's touch. There are no family pictures above the stone fireplace, no beautiful or comfortable-looking furniture. In fact, there isn't much furniture at all. The walls are wooden and plain. An oversized, beaten-up brown chair sits across from a wood-filled fireplace, alone. My eyes scan the area while comparing the emptiness in this room to the solemn man who lives inside it. As I turn my gaze to search the house further, a dark shadow captures my attention. There, I'm met with the haunting image of the man I've cared about all my life. V stands in front of me, and, from the looks of it, he's wet from a shower— with only a towel wrapped around his neck, his chest is bare and glistening. He's wearing a black pair of running pants that hang low on his hips, giving me a glimpse of the trail of hair leading to where I nearly got to touch weeks before. My insides shake with anxiety and nervousness, but more so with desire. For weeks, I've thought about being alone with V, alone in a way that he gives me what I never believed I truly wanted until he left— I want all of him. The fear of being with a man as powerful as he is. The frustration and anger he brings out with his unwillingness to face what's between us. The safety he offers in sheltering those he loves the most. But more than anything, 
I want what V keeps so guarded. I want his heart. Pulling me out from my study of his beauty, V snaps, What the fuck are you doing here? I... I start to explain, but can't. What am I doing here? Clara, tell me you didn't drive alone out into the middle of nowhere. He harshly scolds. Tell me you at least had the common sense to have someone escort you. Reminding me of the ridiculously threatening discussion V had with Ruan, I slam the front door behind me. The decorative pictures tremor against the wall, but I don't wince at the sound. The blood rushing to my ears is all I hear. Why did you do that to him? I hiss, leaning forward, still several feet away. Why would you tell Ruan he isn't allowed near me? Cocking his brow, V says nothing. He offers no explanation at all. You threatened him, I want to know why. Watch your tone when you address me, Clara. He growls in warning. Ignoring his order, I press, Ruan is my friend. I care about him. He takes three large steps in my direction. My back meets the door when the front of V's body slams against mine, stealing my breath as well as my courage. The cords of his neck are strained, his jaw tight, and his breathing shallow. Why did you come? He hisses with added agitation. As his fingers lift my shirt to explore the skin of my waist, his heated gaze gives way to what he's thinking, what he wants. Tell me exactly why you're here, alone with me, when you know you shouldn't be. My voice is small, but after licking my dry lips, I manage to get out. I'm here for everything. Everything you promised each time you kissed me. Clara, he seethes, taking a step back as his nostrils flare and his eyes blaze in fury. I want everything you promised when you touched me. I continue goading, standing in front of him with a liar's confidence. When I inhale a deep breath... Our chests meet, V looks down, studies the connection, and then states, Don't fucking push me. What are you so afraid of? Afraid? He returns with a mock laugh. Afraid? I confirm, then assume, Vlad Zaleski is scared of caring about a woman. Say that again. He clips, his hands bawling to fists while his entire body tenses. You're scared. Stepping forward again, V backs me fully against the door. Every part of him is touching every part of me. I feel small, dwarfed in being this close, but safe, always safe. His hand trails my side, his fingers curving around my waist. My name, he utters, looking down and watching his thumb trace the base of my breast. Warmth spreads through my body as I gasp for needed air, my hand lifts between us, my finger tracing the strong and stubbled line of his jaw. Vlad, I test. His eyes turn molten. They scorch my body with each pass up and down my chest, neck, face, my skin pebbles beneath his scrutinizing glare. Somewhere inside him, V is fighting a war of truth versus temptation. He wants this. His threat to Ruan was meant with a specific purpose. My beautiful girl, I want this. Knowing Vlad could break my heart, shatter it to unrecognizable pieces, and leave me regretful of my decision to come here, I don't waver. I want each brutally beautiful piece of himself he'll give me. When he steps back, I say again, Vlad his chest rising with an inhale of breath, is the only warning I'm given before I'm lifted off my feet, cradled in his arms, and laid to the floor. Vled. She said my name. She said it as a woman, not a child. No longer am I the monster V I once was, but a man she came here to find. If Clara were to attempt an escape, I wouldn't let her. I couldn't. A woman as beautiful as she is, as smart and perceptive, must have already come to this foregone conclusion. The moment she willingly stepped foot inside this cabin, Clara became the helpless prey to my animalistic desire. 
the startled lamb caught in the ravenous lion's den, the heuristic angel imprisoned within the arms of the demoralizing devil. She'll no longer be a young woman, lost amidst a carnal world of men who look at her as they do, want her as they desire. No one will ever touch her as long as she's in my bed. For as long as this is to last, she'll only ever submit to me. The power in this knowledge is my undoing. Vlad, she whispers again, her voice tense and shaky. Ignoring what could be her second thoughts, my hand trails down her thigh. With the hem of her dress within my reach, I pull it up and slide my fingers beneath it. She gasps, her eyes widening in surprise as I push the material aside, aiming for the soft flesh. You do this to me, I seethe, thrusting myself against her and closing my eyes to maintain control. Prying apart her thighs, I fist the scrap of material between them and viciously yank it from her body. Clara cries out, her neck arching, and her eyes slamming shut. This is what you came here for, I taunt, roughly covering her sex before thrusting a single finger inside. Her body pulsates upon invasion, and this time she doesn't gasp. She sighs. Vlad, she whispers. Reaching through the tight space between us, Clara slides her hands down my stomach until finding purchase on my aching cock. Her caress so light I jolt in place. The feel of her touch is nearly painful. The faint mist of her breath on my lips begs for me to taste her. The familiar scent of lilacs once again ruins all my resolve. Covering her mouth with my own, I swallow her sharp moan and thrust myself farther into her small hand, forcing her to touch all of me. Spread your legs, I instruct, reveling in the inexperience of her play. Once again my name crosses her lips. This time she says it as she never has before, with the passion of a woman thirsting for gratification. Offer yourself to me, Clara. Clara does as I've asked. Without hesitating, she positions me at her entrance. In one long and furious drive, I push forward, finding purchase inside her warm, tight, wet center. Biting down, she clenches her teeth and gasps for air. Her neck arches, unintentionally ripping her mouth from mine. Look at me, I clip, pulling out of her only to slide back in with more force than before. When she doesn't do as I've told her, I reach up to gather a handful of hair. Before unintentionally causing her pain, I stop and take in a needed breath. My voice softens as I direct, My beautiful girl, give me your eyes. Clara drops her chin where her face stills below mine. Our eyes meet, our breaths mix together, our bodies rouse and sink. Finally, all the answers to all the questions I've ever asked about Clara are answered. I was meant to have her. More, she whispers, a small smile claiming her lips as a tear falls to her temple. Don't slow down and don't stop. Bending down, I kiss the tear away, my hips thrust forward, feeling every inch of her insides pulsating with guttural need. Greedy, I tease, the curve of my lips forming a smile. Her eyes shine with sexual anticipation as I lift her thigh, showing her where to rest it. Wrap your legs around me, tight, don't let go. Nodding, she does as I instruct, but more. Her hips begin to match every measure of mine. Her breathing labors, and she whispers my name again and again between the scattering of quiet kisses along my throat and chest. I continue driving deep without relent. Her body tenses. She shudders, digging her feet into my back, 
bringing her entire body flush against mine as I push into her again and again. Carnal moans and feral growls echo between us as I grab the flesh behind each of her thighs, lifting them further in order to drive deeper, harder than I can nearly withstand. As her body releases, her face flushes red. The vision of her beneath me is nothing in comparison to what I've seen in my mind's eye so many times before. The image itself spurs my own release, coaxing me into emptying inside her, to savagely take her again and again, to thoroughly mark her until I'm all she's able to remember, to undoubtedly claim her in ways she'll never want to be free again. In every way possible, I've shattered the same innocence I've tried so hard all her life to protect. 20. Clara He's taken me completely, invaded my body in ways I've only heard or read about. During my life with him, Vlad's caused me pain, anguish, and regret. But with that, he's also been the pillar of his family's strength, the base of my confusion, and now the one man I'll compare to every other. I was wrong before. So incredibly wrong— I didn't come alive the night Vlad kissed me on that hotel bed. I was merely awakened. Without a doubt now, though, I feel each and every breath I take. Now I'm alive. I'm sitting up in bed and looking around the barren room, filled with dark furniture, drapes, and bedding. There's a dresser at the foot of the bed. All it holds is a black, shiny box. Vlad's watch sits on top of it, along with his wallet and some change. Last night, after his patience finally snapped, and he gave in to what I had hoped was what we both wanted, neither of us had much to say. My head was tired from lack of sleep and worry, not to mention my body was deliciously spent. Not much was said after he carried me to bed. I wasn't sure if there was anything to say, so I stayed quiet. He must have felt the same, because he did, too. Finally, she wakes. Vlad greets quietly, sounding relieved as he stands at the door. Taking a few steps into the room, he heads straight toward the heavy dark wooden dresser at the end of the bed. Hi, I manage to nervously utter, suddenly feeling exposed. Bringing the hunter green sheet to my chest, I drop my chin and half smile to myself. I'm in Vlad's bed, at his cabin, after he lost control and put this on, he instructs, standing over me holding a plain black t-shirt that smells like him. On Vlad, its fit is tight, straining under his chest and arms. On me, it's sure to fit like a sheet. I have clothes, I tell him, not wanting to wear that. In my bag in the other room, I can, bending over me, Vlad places a fist on either side of where I sit. The bed dips with his weight. He's close. I smell the soap from his shower. His hair is damp, his face freshly shaven. He looks younger from this angle, eye to eye and mouth to mouth. Nodding to where the shirt now sits near my leg, he directs, You'll wear that and nothing under it. Instinctively, my eyes narrow. No one likes to be told what to do, especially a woman my age about what she can and cannot wear. You're ridiculous, I challenge. You won't deny me. Deny you? His hand slides up my thigh, where his fingers curve between them both. Without touching me at all, I know exactly what he's meaning to say. I'll wear that, I snap, grabbing it from the bed as instructed, but also add, for now. Good girl, he soothes, sending now familiar shivers sliding down between my legs. After kissing me quick and hard, Vlad pulls back. I'm making lunch. We'll eat and we'll talk. He's making lunch? You're making lunch? The side of his mouth tips, forming an evil smirk. I'm good at more than making you moan my name, he states. I gasp in surprise. Though after last night, I believe I may be better at that than anything else. I gasp again, 
this time while holding my breath. Releasing it, I advise. You're not ridiculous. You're outrageous. Last night, as I was sleeping soundly beside him, my back tucked safely against his front, Vlad's mouth came to my ear, where he kissed it sweetly before thrusting his awakened cock against my lower back. I wasn't sure if I could take more of him so soon, but as he slowly and carefully pushed himself inside, stretching me to fit around him, I wanted him again. When I take you again tonight, I aim to be even better yet. Now I'm speechless, outright smiling, Vlad turns in place while saying, Up, my beautiful girl. Kitchen. Ten minutes. Shower. Shave. Lather. Rinse. Repeat. I'm stalling, fearing what this talk with Vlad will entail, fearing his version will be an apology for his temporary loss of control. Twice. Once again, I'm fearing his rejection, Grabbing the black shirt from the basin, I slip it on, not bothering to dry my hair. I've already taken too much time. No question the ill-mannered, quick-tempered brute is fuming at how long I've been in here after being timed. Ten minutes? Gathering as much of my courage as I'm able, I make my way down the sunlit hall before turning left into the large, L-shaped kitchen and dining area. With the shiny silver appliances and the dark ceramic tile floor, I assume it was Faina who must have had a hand in decorating. Vlad sitting quietly at the kitchen table, reading notes written on several tabs of paper all stuck to a larger one. When I lean against the wall and clear my throat to announce myself, he looks up. And when he does, I'm reminded that not only am I wearing his shirt, but because of its size, hanging so low in the front— it doesn't leave much to the imagination. Dropping the paper, Vlad sits back in his chair and positions his hands to his lap. His eyes peruse every inch of my exposed skin, starting at my face and dropping to my thighs. His broad chest coaxes my attention, but even a sight so beautiful can only hold it for a moment. Visions invade particularly those of Katrina, as she sat astride his thighs while I stood as witness of him, taking her so aggressively. Our time together wasn't the same, and I've been left wondering if it should have been or not. Clara. He calls as if sensing my doubt. Before giving myself another confusing moment to think, I blurt the first thought, more so demand, that comes to mind. No more whores. A moment passes before he responds with angry confusion. What did you say to me? I said, no more whores. I state again, this time louder. I don't know what any of this means. I continue, gesturing back to the bedroom door. But I know I couldn't bear the thought of you and here. He clips sternly, raising his arms for me to do as I'm told. Come to me. Shaking my head, I stand in place. I lean my body against the kitchen wall, my hands flat against it at my back, helping to ground me to it. Promise me, V. Last night you called me Vlad, he replies with irritation. I prefer that to this. Last night I did call him Vlad, and it was my voice saying his name for the first time in any meaningful way that coerced a heated reaction I hadn't seen coming. Are you going to make that promise? Damn it, Clara. I said come to me. No. I shake my head. Vlad stands but doesn't take a single step closer. Say the next time you touch me, whenever that may be, you haven't been with her or any of those others like her. If you don't come to me, I'll come to you, he threatens, his eyes narrowing. If you can't give me your word, then all this goes away, now. Being with you last night, waking up to you this morning, all of it. More annoyed now than angry, Vlad sighs. If you don't get your ass over here, I'll come to you. When I do, it'll be to put you over my knee. My mouth drops open at his words. I'd never been punished while living with Vlad and Faina, but I never did anything to warrant such punishment. Veni, always. Me, never. 
With all patience lost, Vlad stalks toward me. The look on his face is ominous. I've upset him, maybe rightly so. A woman like me doesn't tell a man like him what he can and cannot do. Fair to say there isn't a woman on earth who could summon Vlad to promise anything, including Faina and Muck. Once he's closed all but a few inches between us, Vlad bends his neck so his mouth dearly brushes mine. The anger in his features lessens. Inhaling deeply, his eyes close. My Lex, he mutters to my confusion. Looking down between us, he sighs again. I'm not her, I assure quietly. I can't ever be like her. If you need more from me, then stop talking, he insists, running his finger over my cheek, his eyes following every inch. You're going to wear yourself down with all these crazy thoughts before I have another chance to wear you down in a way I like much more. Tears fill my eyes at his lack of promise. I meant what I said. I wouldn't be able to bear the burden in knowing Vlad touched another woman the same way he's touched me. Maybe I'm not in love with him. Not yet. But if I ever were, my heart wouldn't only break if he were unfaithful— It'd be ruined for all others. Don't distract me, Vlad. Tell me you won't go to another woman. You're clean, Clara. You're beautiful. As long as I have you in my bed, there won't be a need for anyone else. How long do you plan to have me in your bed? I question, not caring about the compliment as much as the way he stated the rest. Straightening his posture and looking down with confidence, Vlad's hand caresses my cheek. I don't have that answer, but I can tell you this. Coming to me with demands doesn't work. I'm not like the others, I explain, my heart weary of his lack of promise. Moving the stray strands of hair from my forehead, Vlad states, Last night was good. For me as well as you, it's important you don't overthink what it was. What it was? Sex, Clara. You gave yourself to me. So you won't make any promises, I surmise with defeat. I won't, but as I said, if you're in my bed, there's no need for anyone else. You'll enjoy what we have. I'll make sure of it. But don't make demands. What now? I change the subject. What happens today? Tomorrow, when we leave here? You're with me, he informs. Taking in a deep breath, I don't get the chance to exhale. Vlad's mouth covers mine, his tongue sliding inside as his hands wrap around my waist. My hands lift between us, exploring his chest, neck, and shoulders. With a brutal shove, my back hits the wall, and Vlad pulls away, breathing heavily with restraint. A piece of you will always belong to me. That will never change. When his forehead rests on mine, I close my eyes, hearing his words circle in my head over and over. I will always belong to him. In some way, I've always belonged to him. But now I'm his, completely, for however long this lasts. Do you understand? He asks, raising his head and scanning my face for assurance. I won't hurt you. I don't need whores from my stable. To both, I promise. Relief courses through my body. Vlad's hand wraps around my neck, forcing my face closer to his. Kiss me now, he instructs. Doing as told, I stand on the tips of my toes to gain leverage. As soon as my lips touch his, Vlad takes over, Lowering himself, he grasps my thighs on either side and lifts me in the air. The kiss is desperate, frenzied, hungry, claiming, an unsigned agreement to all we've discussed. I'm his. Pulling back, his eyes slowly open with mine. You'll never get me to leave this cabin if you don't put something else on. What I'm wearing was your choice, remember? I snidely comment, testing my new boundaries. You said, Vlad sets me to my feet, kissing my nose and directs, Eat your lunch, then pack your things because we're going home. Home. 
to his home. To our home. After kissing me again, this time with less enthusiasm, he turns around, then he walks out of the room, leaving me alone to revel in his promised words. If I have you in my bed, there won't be a need for anyone else. I won't hurt you. I don't need whores from my stable. To both, I promise. Vlad stated clearly that, for now, I belong to him. It's not until this moment, as I stand alone swaying at the loss of his touch, that I realize he also finally belongs to me. 21. Vlad. We're back. The ride home was quiet. Aside from Clara's attempts to get to know my personal preferences about this and that, she mostly kept to herself. Her interest in my work was something she thankfully didn't touch. One thing we haven't discussed but will when the time is right is that even being with me as she is and will be for the foreseeable future, she has a place and will adhere to her place without question. The moment I step outside and onto the back deck, any enjoyment I had in my time spent with Clara is lost. Every gasp of her breath, every exploring touch of her fingertips, every whisper murmured in the dark. All of it vanishes when I take in the loud voice that led me out here in the first place. Faina. My dear little sister stands in protest, hands to her hips. One foot is kicked out to the side, in front of both Ruan and Gleb. I can only see her face and profile, but there's no mistaking it's irate and fuming with fury. Ruan looks gravely scolded and utterly speechless. Gleb, standing at his side, appears nothing of the same. My head of security appears amused. The distinction of their reaction in the face of my sister's ire attests to their experience and age and years lived within this family. Faina has always had this way with people. Wearing them down into submission has usually been used as her last resort. If she wants something bad enough, she'll use whatever means to get it. What a beautiful bully Faina Zaleski is. You didn't have the authority to do that, Gleb, she blasts, now with her back turned to me. You can't just peck my stuff and tell me I'm leaving my home. The fingerprints of my father are all over this. It's Vori who's pissed her off. She may have come home from wherever her latest trip led her, but she didn't come home to the welcoming arms she assumed she would and judging by the wrath she's delving out to both Gleb and Ruan. I imagine it's the two of them who informed her of Vori's decision to have her with him back in Russia. Faina, damn it. Be pissed. Fine. Whatever. But packing your shit was an order, Gleb clearly states. An order I took seriously, considering it was Vori who gave it. You packed my panties, Gleb! She snaps, this time louder. When she takes a breath to settle herself, she venomously clips. And wipe that stupid smile off your face. It's pissing me off. You were already pissed, Gleb congenially mumbles. Sighing, he turns his gaze to Ruan, who's gone from looking utterly scolded to outright afraid. Between my discussion with him in regards to keeping his distance from Clara while I was away, and now facing Faina as he is, Ruan looks beaten at every turn. And you! My sister pushes her finger into Ruan's chest. He rocks back on the foot before she gets out a deliberate blow. I expected more from you. Faina! He starts, but stops. When he looks up at me standing in the doorway, an unmistakable blanket of relief covers him entirely. Thank God. Thank fuck, Gleb says next, looking down and removing his sunglasses from the top of his plain black t-shirt. Pointing over Faina's shoulder, he instructs, There, talk to him. 
Faina twists her head, and I'm certain if women could breathe fire, she'd burn the house down around me, and wouldn't so much as spit in aid to put it out. Vled, what the fuck is going on? She crudely questions, giving her back to those she's brutalized in wake of my absence. Ruan takes not even a moment to garner his escape and immediately walks around her. He doesn't chance a look back either. Gleb follows, but he does it smiling while replacing his sunglasses. Through their shades I note the aging wrinkles around the corners of his eyes. He doesn't try to hide his amusement at all. Unpack me, Ruan! I'm not leaving! My sister screams her last demand. Jesus Christ, he utters in response as I step to the side, giving him room to escape. I'll be in the kitchen helping Mark with what the fuck ever she wants. Anything to get me out of here. Gleb slaps Ruan's shoulder, saying nothing to me as they make their way out, but tells his protege, This little brother is reason enough to never settle down. If you ever get your dick caught in a woman and you forget this moment, come find me. I'll remind you to run. Once they're out of sight, I turn back to watch my sister standing alone, her hip resting on the iron railing. Her focus is on the large expanse of our property. Her arms are crossed around her waist, and in profile I find her eyes still narrowed, still fired up and furious. The sun is bright, the birds are singing. Faina holds no appreciation for either. Glad to see you found your way home, Faina, I greet, walking to her cautiously. I was afraid you forgot where we lived. Fuck off, she snaps, then corrects her tone with, Glad to see you're back too. How was your vacation? My vacation was more than I had hoped it would be. Visions of Clara just this morning, willingly submitting to me again without question, come to mind with satisfaction. The fact she'd given me every inch of her, body and soul, has only baited me to get back to her for more. I don't voice any of this to my sister, of course. We need to talk, Faina clips still not looking directly at me, but succeeding in pulling me from my memories of soft skin and the fresh smell of lilac. Soon. I need to see to a few things, but I'll make myself free for you within the hour. Free, she aimlessly whispers. God, brother, will either of us ever be free? Reaching over and daring to touch her, I wrap my arm around her shoulders and bend to kiss her temple. She doesn't return my attention, but instead her body jolts to free itself. You look different. Content, even, she accuses, using her finger to signal over my body in front of hers. Unfortunately, if there's anyone who'd notice, it'd be her. Why do you look so happy? Shit. Fine. I'm the same as I was when I left. You're not. Leaning toward her, raising my voice to ensure she stops prodding, I reassure I am. Time off has done you good, I see. Vori insisted and he was determined. I bring up what I know has her upset. Determined to ruin my life, she mumbles. You're leaving. Turning back to the yard, Faina's shoulders tense. With her hands balled to fists, she replies, Not if I can help it. Faina, I warn. Fuck him, Vlad, she cries. I'm a grown woman. He doesn't get to tell me what to do. I don't live under his roof anymore. No, I agree. You live under mine. Looking over, she pins me with an infuriated glare. And? And I'm reminding you to pick your battles. Go home. Do whatever you're supposed to do. Then, when the time is right, you'll come back. You're siding with him, she murmurs with disappointment. 
I'm not siding with anyone. I can't believe this. You are... Baina. When I reach to grab her, she steps away. Turning in place, she doesn't look at me as she storms back into the house, and of course, slamming the door behind her. Welcome home. I'm in my study with Abram as he fills me in on all I missed over the last week. Seems my father not only handled my day-to-day -day business dealings while I was away, but he also happened to track down a lead to who had been snapping pictures of Clara. At least there's good news with the bed, Abram deduces. We know the players. If Katrina is wanting revenge against you, she went to the right man to help get it. Chiro fucking Pileshi. And if this Osef is really who he's telling people he is, and he's so desperate to get to Clara, that means Clara has family she's never met. Clara's mother, Amer, had a brother. I'd known this even before I'd banished her away from her daughter. Osef Embers had been working the docks near the Boston Bay at the time. When word got to him of what I did to Clara's father, Enzen, rumors made it back to me that Osef was elated. Recently, I'd heard her mother killed herself, hanging a noose around her neck and falling from her own kitchen table. Not long after, I had also heard that Osef had been asking around about the niece he'd never met. I sent one of my men to warn him off, and it appeared to have worked, as I never heard about him again. The thought that Osef has once again started to take interest in his long-lost niece doesn't sit well, especially if he's stupid enough to do it behind my back, yet still at my front door. Find out where Osef is now, will you? I request. And also find out if Amer has any more relatives who could come crawling for Clara. And if I find any? At this question, I look up. Do you think it's possible Clara has any interest in knowing where she came from? No, I answer quickly. She doesn't. Over fifteen years have passed, and not once did one single person extend a hand to find her. Whether they were afraid of my organization or they were apprehensive to take on a child they didn't know much about is no longer relevant. She's not going anywhere. Clara stays, I sternly voice. She could have a family out there, Vlad, Abram reasons. And yes, Faina and Vanny are... What part of my answer was left for debate? I counter, determined. The answer is no. Whatever you find, Clara will never know. No matter who you find. Am I understood? Christ, Vlad, he hisses, leaning up in his chair. I get it. Good, I reply, sitting back in my own, relieved at the lead my father procured. Even if it costs additional disappointment in his eyes, I'm happy to have whoever is looking into Clara handled. Carefully, Abram questions, How is Clara? As innocent of an inquiry as this may be, Abram already hopes for something between Clara and me. Rather than feed into his curiosity, I answer vaguely. She's good, I think. Vlad, Abram says, smiling. Leaning back, he keeps his eyes on me. Tell me. Not now, I return. Not ever if you're thinking of going where I think you're going. Outright laughing, Abram covers his mouth. Once he's collected himself, he replies, I never really thought you'd go there at all. Twisting my neck back and forth, casually releasing the tension, waiting at the back, I say nothing. Abram, however, refuses to let it go. Of course, maybe I'd hoped you'd go there. She's hardly difficult to look at, let alone the way she looks at you. If I had a gun close, the chances of shooting him for talking about Clara the way he is would be great. Standing, Abram slides his hands into his pockets. His chest is shaking, 
clearly still amused at my predicament. If you ever want to talk, my friend, he addresses seriously. I'm here. If not, just know I'm still here if that changes. Osif, I remind him. Find out more about where he's been the last few years specifically. I want all you have by tomorrow afternoon. Will do, he nods. Back to work after he walks away, I listen as Faina crosses paths with Abram in the hall. Her greeting to him is short, cutting to the quick. Coming to stand in front of my desk, Faina looks worse off than she was only an hour ago as she left me on the deck. Bending down, she hisses, What the hell have you done? Abram, not yet gone, comes back to stand inside the door. When I nod in his direction, he doesn't leave. Whatever's gotten into my sister this time certainly doesn't require a witness. Faina, sit, I guide. What have you done? She repeats, this time louder, causing Abram to adjust from his position at the door to standing straight at attention inside the room. You son of a bitch! She seethes. Sit down, I demand, this time raising my voice as she did hers. And tell me what the fuck you're talking about. Slapping her hand on my desk, the sharpness of it echoes between us. She's a child, she shrieks. Clara. Fled? Abram asserts, causing my sister to turn her head. I'll stay. Out, she directs him, pointing her finger to the door. Even face to face with Faina's obvious fury, Abram doesn't budge. Instead, he continues looking at me, eyebrows raised, awaiting an order. He's waiting for word to remove my fiery sister if needed. Or, knowing Abram, he's waiting alongside her to hear my clean confession. I raise my hand and shake my head. Close the door behind you, Abram. Do what I've asked and I'll be in touch later. Once the door clicks shut, Faina forgets her place. You fucked her, she says first, turning in the small circle before taking two steps away from my desk. Clara, Vlad, my sweet Clara, you... She loses her words along with some of the color in her face. Yes, I did. I returned to her surprise, then drive the knife of her ire deeper with a few times, actually. Oh, my God! Where have you been? I query. My question and tone may as well have physically bitten her. Being that she stops moving and looks directly at me with fear, I can't explain. Faina, I prod. Tell me where you've been. She's too young for this, Vlad, she expresses with disbelief. She's never experienced anything like... Where have you been? I ask again, losing patience. This isn't about me. How could you? A part of me knew Clara would have questions about what happened between us. As we parted for the first time once we'd gotten home... I didn't want to let her go. She looked uncertain and lost, but it was also clear she was determined. I should have known her determination would lead her straight into the ear of my sister, and that, in return, my sister would react just as she is now. I wasn't going to ask Clara to keep our time together a secret from anyone. There would be no reason. I've taken her in the ways I've made her mine, and whatever fallout my sister or anyone else in this house feels this has led to is of no concern to me. Truth be told, only a few weeks have passed since Faina came to me with favors and plans for Clara. Ruan was included in said plans. My sister couldn't have known her unintentional matchmaking had a part in seeding what was inevitably bound to happen. Clara is an adult, I point out. You've said this yourself, countless times, if you remember. 
You took advantage of her, she says through a heavy gasp. You brought her to me, Faina. I brought her to you? A genuine hurt covers her face. How? You may as well have gift-wrapped her for me, dressing her in those clothes and... Astonished, Faina frowns. You can't be saying I helped send her to that cabin so you could fuck her. Even for you, that's... that's sick. Stop it, I demand. What's done is done. So you're going to leave this alone. Ignoring me once again, she pushes. What in God's name were you thinking? I was thinking how beautiful Clara's body would be between my sheets, and how hard it would be to resist lying with her beneath them. Then I was thinking of how beautiful it would be to have a clean, untouched woman of intelligence and class. I was focused on how many ways I could be inside that body again and again, taking her to the verge of lost control before bringing her back down only to do it all over again once she did. More to pressing matters, I fight back what I'd rather be doing with Clara right now and ask Faina, where the fuck have you been? I'm ashamed of you, she replies, walking back toward my desk. You knew better. Give me your answer and don't lie. If you do, I'll know. Leaning over my desk, Faina points to my chest. You'll hurt her once she knows it's over, and all of this meant nothing to you. Are you seeing someone, I ask, ignoring whatever she's insinuating? Have you been leaving home to run off and meet a man? End it with Clara, she bites out. Hearing her demand, I stand. My sister has always been granted more than enough extension on her leash, but now, with Clara, she's gone too far. I'm not ending anything, I hiss, leaning toward her as her head rears back. Pointing to her as she did me, I curtly advise, You don't have a say who I fuck or when, nor the reasons why. End it, she snaps again. You'll break her heart. No. This life is dangerous, you know this. She's an adult, Faina. She understands. She doesn't. I can protect her. You can't. I won't end anything. You will, Vlad. I won't, I bellow as Faina's body jolts in place. She's not yours, she shouts, her hands flailing uncontrollably around the room. She belongs with someone her own age, someone who can care for her in the way you won't. You can't. Stop this, I demand at the same time walking around my desk. Faina takes a few steps back, heading toward the door. You'll get the rest of your things together and you'll go, I instruct. Your life isn't with mine anymore, Faina, and it sure as hell isn't with Clara's. You didn't say that, she whispers in disbelief. Vlad, you don't mean that. It's one thing you understand his side but another that you stand against mine. You've been sleeping with a man I not only don't know, but one I haven't approved of. The deceptive lines between us have already been drawn. Without denying my claim, not once since entering my office, Faina shrinks in defeat. I've worked so hard with her, Vled. I never wanted our lives to touch hers. Closing my eyes in reprieve, I exhale. Faina's right. She never wanted Vanny or Clara near our lives as we've come to understand them. You may have doubted my intentions with her before, Faina, but I need you to not doubt them now. I'm sorry, Vled, she whispers, although not an apology for anything she said. But I don't know you. My big brother wouldn't do what he's about to do to that sweet young woman waiting upstairs. He wouldn't, she says, shaking her head. I don't understand any of this. 
and the idea of you and her. Goodbye, Aina. Nodding, looking to the floor, my sister quietly gives in and bids, Goodbye, Vlad. 22. Clara. He'll ruin you, Clara. You're nowhere near experienced enough to handle a man like Vlad. Faina's words haven't stopped spinning through my mind since she spoke them. When she came to my room this afternoon, saw I wasn't packing, and how happy she thought me to be, she already knew. He's going to break your heart. He won't do it intentionally, but he will. When she demanded to know what exactly happened between Vlad and me, I told her. I wouldn't keep anything from Faina, partially because it wouldn't do much good anyway. She'd find out and be hurt knowing I kept something as big as this from her. This is dangerous, Clara. A man who lives as he does has enemies. They'll use you to get to him. As she stormed out of my bedroom, she took all the assurances Vlad had given me with her. My conscience began to doubt everything we'd shared— I've never allowed opinions and judgments of others to sway how I did or didn't feel about something as being important, but Faina's anger was abruptly palpable. Like Vori, my brother isn't capable of loving a woman before all else, or loving a woman at all. It's late, Venny unexpectedly observes, standing in the door of my room, leaning his shoulder against it. Why are you still up? Glancing at the clock on my dresser, I hadn't realized it was already nearly eleven. I haven't spoken to Vlad since we got back mid-morning. He left me standing at the front door. After telling me he'd see me later and kissing my forehead, he left in the direction of his study. Not knowing what to do with myself, I went to find something to do. Why are you still up? I counter, avoiding Venny's concentrated gaze. Raising his eyebrows, Venny pulls himself from the door and takes a few steps into my room. He scans my now empty suitcase. Plopping himself on my bed, as I sit on my floor sorting clothes, he replies, I hate when Dad and Aunt Faina fight like that. It bugs me, because they hardly ever do. I know. I sympathize. I'm sorry. Grinning, Venny reaches to my dresser and picks up the pendant I bought for V weeks ago. His thumb runs over the top. Guilt sieges. As awkward as it would be to explain to Venny how I've come to feel about his father, he's incredibly perceptive. He'll figure it out, and like Faina, he'll be upset I said nothing. Why are you sorry? He asks, setting the pendant down. It's not your fault they're fighting. Is it? Swallowing hard, I shake my head. I'm heading to the kitchen for some of Mog's pecan pie. You want to go? Smiling and tossing a throw pillow at him, I question, isn't that supposed to be for tomorrow? Yep, but Mog's asleep and I'm starving. I think I'll pass, but thank you. All right, he replies. Once he reaches my door, he turns in place. It's nice to have you back. I kind of missed you. Returning his grin, I return with truth. I kind of missed you, too. Once he's out of sight, I take in a deep breath and exhale slowly. Vlad. The hallway is dark as I round the corner from the stairs. This entire day has been exhausting. Between Faina's secrets and anger, needing to find more information about Osef, and Clara being out of sight for this long, I'm ready to find her in my bed and sleep. However, when I open my bedroom door, the room is completely as I left it, empty. Clara's nowhere to be found. Apparently, I hadn't made myself clear while being inside her over the last two days. Partially curious and fully annoyed, I make my way to her room. The house is quiet. At this hour, I hadn't expected anyone to be awake. When I enter her room, the whole light casts an angelic glow over her body as she lies in bed sound asleep. Her suitcase sits empty near her dresser. Her blankets, clothes, and shoes litter the floor. Anxious to see her beautiful face, 
I walk to her bed, and without so much as warning her first, I bend, grabbing her behind the knees and around her waist, and cradle her to my chest. Wait, she shrieks, still half asleep. Quiet, I snap. You'll wake everyone at this end of the house. Moving the hair from her face, Clara's big green eyes come to mine with shock. What are you doing? Where are we going? Apparently, you've gotten lost. What? Clara, you're in the wrong fucking bed. Confused, her eyebrows furrow as I carry her out into the hall. The bright light blinds her momentarily, and her hand comes up to shield her eyes. I was in my bed, she snaps. Sleeping. It's what people do, until you barged in like... The bedroom door next to hers opens. Mock stands silent. She's dressed in a frilly white robe and purple fuzzy slippers. Thick pink curlers are twisted in her hair beneath a white net cap she wears tightly over them. Taking in the long, silent look at what's in front of her, Mock's mouth drops open before her hand flies to her chest. Oh my God, Clara! Sweetheart, are you hurt? Shit. Vlad, she shrieks in panic. Put her down right now. Let me have a look at her. Taking her hand from her eyes, Clara looks down at Mock and smiles softly. When she doesn't say anything, Mock walks in close and covers Clara's forehead with the palm of her hand. The next to join our party is Ruan, with Veni following closely at his heels. The two boys are both fully dressed, indicating they've been playing video games this late into the night, or listening to that hideous music they're both so enamored with. I'm not sure which is worse. Ruan takes in the sight as Mok did, only he comes to terms with what's happening much quicker than our elderly charge. Boss, he nods with a knowing smile. His eyes move to Clara, and he greets her quietly. Clara? When I look down, Mock's hand is no longer on Clara. Clara's face is flushed. I despise her reaction to Ruan's presence. Before leaving the cabin, Clara made me swear to yet another promise. I was to work things out with Ruan, apologize for acting like a Neanderthal, as she put it, and lift the ban of him not interacting with or speaking to her without me near. The way Ruan's gazing at her in my arms now, he's lucky my hands are full or he'd be bleeding profusely from his nose. Vlad, what's going on? Muck questions, looking to me, then Clara, and finally Ruan and Veni. Like you can't see? Veni sarcastically questions, anger edging his tone. Put it together, Muck. This isn't hard to figure out. Clara gasps, clearly embarrassed. Tiring of this, I snap, Clara will be staying in my room for now. What? The old woman whispers. Mock, have all of her belongings moved to my suite? Okay, she answers, still in disbelief. Turning to Ruan, I narrow my eyes. Ruan, get your fucking eyes off Clara. Ruan's obedience is immediate. However, I still catch his small, aimless grin. Veni, why are you still awake? It's nearly one in the morning. Veni starts to answer but can't because Clara interrupts. I cannot believe you, she hisses. Looking down at her in my arms, she appears extremely annoyed. This is good because so am I. Shaming me further, she states, you didn't have to tell them anything right now. Not like this. Ruan turns around and slaps Veni on the chest to get him moving. Both pass without uttering another word in our direction. Mok takes two steps backward into her room and then quietly closes the door. Fucking finally, I'm able to take Clara to bed, where she'll stay until I tell her otherwise. 23. Eight weeks later. Clara.
I'm out. Ruan childishly pouts, tossing his five sad little cards into the middle stack, where Gleb, Abram, and Veni have already surrendered their own. You're out again? I smirk. Exasperated, Ruan runs his hands through his dark hair. That's the third hand in a row you've dealt me shit. If I didn't know you like I do, I'd say you're cheating. Vlad's men and I are in the living room playing five-card poker. This is a game Gleb recently taught me to play. When he did, he told me I wasn't supposed to smile or frown at the cards I was dealt because my opponent would read my expression and I'd lose my bet every time. During this lesson, I quickly figured out that poker is a game built solely on deceit. I've never thought of myself as a good liar, but as I mentally count all the mint packages I have, I'm relishing in how wrong I was. The guys who work here won't play for money. Either they're nervous that I'll lose too much of lads, or they're scared I'll take too much of theirs. I don't know, but either way, as it usually is, tonight I have the most mints. I'm not cheating, I tell the group as they sit around watching me take my winning candy from them in turn. For added emphasis, I drag them in closer and sigh as if the load is too much. Explain that to me, Clara. Why do you always insist we play cards on the floor? Abram questions, placing his hand on his lower back and arching it forward to work out the kinks. Turning my gaze to Gleb, I bite my bottom lip to keep from smiling. Another important lesson I learned while being taught this fabulous liar's game. Gleb told me making the opponents uncomfortable in any way pushes the hand to my advantage. He also suggested I wear something that would grab and keep their attention, thus letting me steal their money. However, the last few months of being with Vlad has taught me to know better. I'm sure our lives together would be smoother if I agreed to wear a heavy parka day in and day out. So far, I've happily met the few requests he's made of me, but I draw the line at a summertime of coats. There's more room on the floor, Abram. Besides, I can take your ante from anywhere, I explain, gathering the cards. At least, if you're already this close to the floor, you don't have much farther to go before hitting rock bottom. I smart, now shuffling the cards like a professional, as Gleb, again, showed me how to do. Oh, you're cute, sweetheart, Abram smirks. Seems you being with Vled has opened a part of you I hadn't expected to find. Ruan's eyes slam shut, and he shakes his head. I don't want to think about what part is open to Vlad. He and Clara being together hasn't sucked in yet. I need more time. Yeah, Venny agrees, leaning toward me from my left and snatching a mint from my winning stack. Looking down at his stack, I find it's almost gone. All that remains are the clear candy wrappers. He's eaten his way through his bet. Go figure. Maybe you could talk to Dad for all of us, Venny hopes, popping the red and white candy in his mouth. You could ask him to keep his hands off you when other people are around. Second that, Venny, Ruan agrees. The older men, Abram and Gleb, both lift their heads and smile. You told me you like that I keep him busy, Venny. Don't lie. At first I did, he admits shyly. But you do realize, if you two end up together forever, that you're going to be my stepmom. Forever. The notion of spending the rest of my life with Vlad is, of course, something I've contemplated. The two of us have come to a place of contentment together. Other than a few arguments, which he usually wins, our new relationship has been an easy transition. I suppose that comes with living together for so long before— Vlad's father, Vori, hasn't interfered at all. I thought he would. He's never liked me. More to say, he's never liked where I came from. In a way, I consider him thinking of me as a traitor. But I'm not. I've been loyal to this family my entire life. Vlad hasn't mentioned anything to me about what Vori thinks of us together, and, to be honest, I'm partial to keeping it that way. Still, even all this time later, Faina hasn't come to agree with my decision to stay with Vlad. The time she's called from Russia to get an update on the family, she's been short and to the point. Part of me understands it's nothing I've done personally, but rather how much she hates her life alone without all of us in it. I don't know. It's good to see Vlad happy, Gleb comments, 
He's much easier to deal with on a daily basis. Oh, if they only knew. He's not always easier to deal with. The time Vlad and I do get to spend together is measured on the degree of his mood. If he's busy with work, stressed, or upset about something he can't control, I know about it. He doesn't have to use his words, either. Vlad's disposition can be determined in the way he touches me, the way he comes to look for me in the middle of the day, and definitely the way he handles me at night. I've become his outlet for every emotion. Sometimes he's sweet. Sometimes he's aggressive. Sometimes he's gentle. Sometimes he's not. None of these I mind at all. I've become accustomed to being everything he needs whenever he needs it. He does the same, but with less consideration. When I ask for space, he gives it. When I ask for his patience, he tries. When I ask for a timeout, physical or otherwise, he uses his domineering way to convince me I don't need it. Leave Vlad alone, I clip, feeling overwhelmed by the sudden need to defend a man who doesn't need defending. You said yourselves, he's happy, I'm happy, and when I'm not, my point is missed as I'm cut off. If there's ever a time Clara isn't happy, then I want to know why. Vlad's deep voice captures all our attention. Twisting my neck, I look up. Vlad is standing in the living room entrance, leaning his shoulder against the jam. His thick and powerful arms are crossed over his chest, where the tattoos lie against one another. He's dressed in his typical camouflage pants and faded black shirt. His heavy boots are resting casually, one over the other. He's also wearing his usual scowl, of course. Fun's over, Venny insists, grabbing a handful of my mints before standing and shoving them in the pocket of his jeans. I don't have to turn to look at him to know he's doing it. I hear the crunch of all my winnings fading in the distance. Boys are ridiculous. Hey, boss, Ruan greets. Vlad, Gleb states next. Your woman is teaching us to play cards, Abram jokes, and she's doing a merciless job of it. Even with all the conversation taking place around me, I haven't taken my eyes from Vlad, nor has he mine. He's tense. The ticking of his jaw gives his mood away. I'll be up in a few minutes, I explain, hoping to persuade. Vlad says nothing, but his eyes narrow. He doesn't like being told what to do. For the life of me, I'll never understand how Faina or Mock has ever gotten him to do anything. This is something I've mentally noted a few times now. I need to know their secret. Vinny, Vlad directs, mildly pointing to our mess. It's late. You should be in bed. I'm sixteen, remember? Then he mentions, as if his own father didn't know. I don't need you to tuck me in. Vlad's jaw ticks again, his temples protruding with each grind. I'll finish here, Venny. I soothe. I'll see you both tomorrow, Abram states. Bending to kiss my cheek before he goes, Abram whispers with his eyes cast beyond my shoulder. You're testing him, Clara. Careful. Careful. The warning isn't needed. There have been a few times now that I've tested the limits of my position in Vlad's life and haven't totally hated the result. I don't voice this, though. Rather, I reply, Tell Alina that Aunt Clara says hello. Standing, Abram puts his hands in his pockets and grins. You're a she-devil. Suddenly, my body is lifted from the floor. In midair, I shriek. I'm roughly maneuvered and tossed over Vlad's shoulder before a swift smack to my ass echoes between those left in the room. That's what I'm talking about, Ruan whines. Laughter breaks out between the others, but not anywhere near Vlad. His pace is quick and footsteps heavy as he takes the stairs two at a time to our room. Neanderthal. I hiss, finally giving up and letting my body go slack with compliance. 24. Vlad Where are you going? Clara asks, sitting up in bed and scanning the room with her very beautiful but also very sleepy eyes. It's late. The clock near the bed reads 2.31 a.m. 
I need to go down and talk to Gleb, I inform, sliding my shirt over my head. Gleb's here now? Yes, and I don't know how long I'll be. Clara turns in bed, sits up and rests her feet on the floor. The black lace nightgown offers a clear view of her naked body beneath it. Temptress. Grabbing my boots from the floor, I remind, you have plans tomorrow. Don't forget them. Thinking through fog and sleep, she remembers. Are you really going to make me learn to shoot a gun, Vlad? I have no reason to ever touch one. With everything that's happened over the last couple months, Clara having no idea about any of it, the answer is certain. Yes. And I'll be meeting you and Abram there once I'm finished for the day. Did something happen? None of your concern, I brush off, walking toward her, and then leaning down to brace my hands on either side of her waist. Something happened, she presses with her usual insistence. Tell me. Osef Embers is what happened. The call I got from Gleb a few minutes ago stated that matters were pressing. He said he has something I needed to come down only in person to hear. If all this means what I think it might, everything I've been worrying about for the last few months will soon be over, giving me more time to focus on my family. More time with Veni, acting as a supportive father rather than the dictator of his life. More time with Faina, bringing her home for a visit and making amends with her as I should have before she left. And definitely more time with Clara, doing... I hate when you're evasive, she pouts. I know what your life, our life, is about, Vlad. You think I'm so oblivious, but I'm not. We've discussed this, I return. My business has nothing to do with you. Vlad, and if you remember correctly, you agreed not to question me. Over the last couple months, Clara has become more insistent regarding my business. Her curious questions have so far gone unanswered. Being that she's determined, I know there will come a time when she won't let a situation pass without input. When that time comes, she'll learn a lesson. Lightly kissing her nose, I smile but say no more. As I stand, Clara throws her body back, flopping on the bed with a dramatic sigh. I don't make a move to touch her, but I don't have to. When she draws her knees up, resting the heels of her feet on the bed, I get an unobstructed view of every inch of her. Are you trying to tempt me? I question in a low voice. No, I'm trying to bribe you, she casually admits. Last night you were somewhere else. I wasn't, I deny. I was with you as I always am. Stretching her long, shapely leg, Clara rests her foot against my stomach. Her red-painted toenails capture my attention first. The heavy breath she exhales calls my gaze to hers. Clara's lowered the top of her gown, and with her chest on display, her fingers run gently over the tips of her pebbled nipples. My lower gut turns, excited at the sight alone, let alone how good the release would feel again, even after just having her not eight hours ago. Stay, she pleads. I won't, Clara. Gleb is waiting. Dropping the arch of her foot, Clara rests it over the material of my pants, finding my cock rigid. You want to stay? She insists again. Clara, I warn. Humph. She huffs with petulance. Even the sight and sound of that makes me want to stay. Feet to the bed and thighs apart, I instruct, making the decision to give her what she's asking. This time, without argument, Clara does as I've told her. Lifting the hem of her gown farther, she exposes herself to me completely. Her inner thighs are still tainted pink, 
signaling she was right. Yes, I was with her last night, but my frustration in business led me to taking her harder than I liked to. I'd missed her, and my need to find Osef was too close to the surface. I was on edge. As I've come to recently understand, Clara was the connection I needed to bring me back home, back to her. Standing between her open legs, I unbuckle my belt. My cock is hard, aching, and ready to be inside her. As I aggressively run my fingers up and down my shaft, Clara's fingers do the same against her clit. We each find our rhythm, but matching it to each other. Her head tilts, aiming to the ceiling, where her eyes close and she releases a weighted moan. Before she's able to regain her focus, I lift her hips from the bed, position myself at her entrance, and then drive into her in one long, rough, and furious thrust. Her fingers grasp at the hem of my shirt, lifting enough until she can claw to my skin. With her eyes open, the dim light from outside casting a shadow on her face, Clara looks down to our connection. I'm here now. I voice, my breathing starting to labor. Is this where you want me? Yes, she replies, grasping me tightly from inside. Moving her hand, she positions it between us. Clara's fingers separate as I drive into her again and again. The added touch pushes me further, closer to release. Say it, Clara, I encourage. Tell me you feel me. I do, she breathes. Please wait, she begs. I won't wait. Her brazen attempt to keep me from taking what's mine and doing with it as I please only adds to my urgency to finish what she's started. When my finger rolls against her swollen clit, Clara's cry of surprise and release echoes between us. She comes hard thrashing on the bed, gripping the covers in her fists. I follow, extending a growl of satisfaction as a bead of sweat drips from my chin to my chest. Now, even more than before, I hate leaving her alone. We've got him. Gleb states in such a rush I nearly miss it. He's already confessed. He's been in touch with both Chiro and Katrina. His plan was to bring Clara to the Palashi estate. Chiro agreed to help him keep her away from you. Away from me. Where did you find him? Abram questions. We're all still standing in the kitchen. This early in the morning, no one is awake or around, not even mock. Sucking in a breath, Gleb answers with hesitance. He's been staying at the motel on Frederick. His car was loaded. An uneasy sense of a threat I hadn't thought of pricks my nerves. Loaded with what? Tape, knives, a bag, and cuffs. He was going to take her against her will if all else failed. Fuck! Abram hisses as my blood begins to boil coursing through my veins and igniting my raging fury with rapid fire. Is he any relation to her at all? He says he's her uncle. So it's really him, then. Amir's brother, I confirm. Nodding, he says again, from what he's claimed, he probably won't really start talking until you convince him to tell us everything. Grabbing the gun from my side, I check the ammunition in the quick and comfortable movement. What the fuck are you doing? Abram hisses. Jesus Christ, Vlad! Put that away before Mok wakes up! You'll give the old woman a fucking heart attack! Let's go, I seethe, aiming my order at Gleb. His hesitation is noted and dismissed. Gleb, I wasn't asking. Vlad! You need to calm down and focus, Abram insists. Jesus Christ, Gleb returns. Tell me he's already here, I seethe, 
itching to do what I haven't done in a long time, maim and kill. I want to play with my prey before robbing it of its breath. He's in the shed. Leonid did all you asked. Then why are we still standing here? He confessed to working with Chiro to get the Clara, right? Abram queries, slapping my shoulder. I don't answer, but he continues. So calm down. This is good. We have him. If he's an uncle, he could be completely harmless. Turning to him, my jaw tenses and my shoulders ache from being tight. I know that look, Abram's eyes roll. I hate that look. Let's go. As I turn in place to head out, I take one step forward before Clara's face, no longer looking sated or tired, but worried and afraid, stares into mine. I have an uncle? She quietly questions, her whisper lost with her breath. Abram tenses, rushing to her side. You should be in bed, sweetheart, he murmurs, grabbing her arms and resting his hand on her lower back. Clara's wearing only my robe. She worries her bottom lip, her face pensive and sharp. I came down when I heard Maximus barking. I thought you'd already left, she states accusingly. What were you talking about? Nothing, Gleb states with no emotion. I have an uncle? No, I clip. Looking around the room, Clara searches the eyes of my men for the truth I haven't given her. I won't give her anything until I've spoken to Osef myself and determined his intent, judging by the inventory Gleb found him with, fit to a kidnapper's liking. His intentions with Clara weren't family-oriented at all. Go back to our room. I'll come for you when I'm finished, I direct. Clara scans my body up and down. She takes in the way I'm dressed, the gun in my holster and the knives in my belt. You're going to hurt him, she notes. If I make that decision, it'll be mine to make. But I heard Gleb say he's my family. I want to meet him. I want to talk to him. Why would you hurt him? Clara, I won't tell you again. Go do as I've told you to do. Shaking her head, she further ignores my order. You're not this person, Vlad. You haven't been for a long time. Vled. A voice from behind Clara calls. Gleb is standing to the side and away from both Clara and me. We should go. Rather than discuss which person Clara feels I am or should be, I step around her, then instruct Abram, take her to her room, talk to her, don't leave her until she's settled. I won't settle, she hisses, taking two steps in his direction. I'm going with you. Just as she's about to pass Abram, she stopped with an arm around her waist. Abram pulls her in close, whispering in her ear, Don't. We'll talk later, but not now. Abram, let me go, she snaps. Clara As Vlad disappears out the door with a black bag I've never seen draped across his shoulder, Abram moves me across the living room into the stairs. I hadn't noticed I'd been shaking until he insists, You've got to calm down. I can't, I reply, walking with him but not clearly seeing where I'm headed. The walls in my line of sight are dim, tunnel vision taking me under. Do you trust me? Abram questions, stopping us at the top of the stairs. Do you trust me to help Vlad do what's right? Yes, I answer, and I do. If anyone in Vlad's life has never wavered from his side, it's Abram. Then promise me you'll stay here. Promise me you'll wait for me to come back. With a heavy sigh, I agree, but on one condition. If I still have family, please don't let Vlad... I can't finish. Although I've been with this family for nearly two decades, the thought of the man I've come to care so much about, ending a life, and one so connected to mine, makes me physically sick. After bending to kiss the top of my head, Abram steps back and searches my face. 
It's good to hear you trust me, Clara, but you also need to trust Vlad. 25. Vlad Enough, Vlad! Abram scolds, dropping the branding iron at his side. The metal object lands on the cement floor with a weighted clink, catching Osef's attention before he drops his head to the side in obvious relief. Offering his unsolicited advice, Abram continues, You're going to kill the man before he sold us anything. Heaving with exertion, I wipe the collective sweat from my brow. Abram remains standing near the door, his back against the wall. As usual, he's holding back his signature smirk. What's fucking funny, Abram? Giving in with a sigh, he walks toward me. Nothing about this, he points to Osif, tied to the cross in front of us. Is funny. But do you? Yes, amusing. Get me the fucking iron, I beckon lifting my chin to where he left it. He'll pass out if you brand him. My friend, I don't know a man who can talk when he's unconscious. He needs to see the pain coming. You've given him enough of that, Abram remarks. He's either going to be loyal to his death, or he's as stubborn as Clara, no doubt making them family. Abram, give me the fucking iron or leave. Doing as I've instructed, Abram starts to move. I leave my attention to where he places it over the burning ember. While he burns the tip, I turn my focus back to Osef. The man hasn't said anything to explain what he intended to do with the items Gleb found him with. His constant pleas of innocence in that those items just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time have grown tiring. With each slash to his chest I've inflicted with my whip, every punch to the face with my hand wrapped in chain, and now the iron coming for him. He's proving his loyalty again and again to whoever he's working for. Not that it's difficult to imagine who that may be. This has the hand of Chiro Pileshi carved in stone around it. Are you ready to give me what I'm asking? Or am I branding you before I cut your throat and you bleed out on my floor? I question. I hear Abram exhale in exasperation, but don't offer to look at him. Gasping for breath and staring at the torture coming, Osef claims, I've done nothing wrong. Clara is my sister's daughter. Your sister's daughter, I repeat with sarcasm grabbing a water at my side and relishing in the hope of his eyes as they look longingly at the bottle. Before drinking, I tilt it in his direction. If you tell me something I need to know, I'll let you have a drink. His eyes close, possibly contemplating on whether his thirst or his life weighs more in this moment. Setting the water down as his gaze follows, I press. Clara is twenty-five now. Did you know this? Yes, he nods. Then you're a liar, I return. I don't share Clara's age. He doesn't deserve to know anything more about her than he already thinks he does. Here, Abram calls, extending his arm with the iron rod in his grasp. Taking it from him, I move in two steps toward my target. Osef's breathing becomes labored as he looks at the glowing hot stone mark of Z. I revel in his desperate attempts to shake himself from his bindings. His efforts are futile. Tell me who you are, who you're working with, and what you really want with Clara. You have five seconds. I told you everything, he reclaims again. Chiro said he knew her and that he could help me get her from you. He exerts. As I extend my arm, the brand sears his skin. The rotten stench of burning hair and melting flesh tinges the air around us. His guttural moan breaks through his agonizing pain, echoing off the walls of the room. I hear steps behind me, 
No question that Abram is turning around in place. His disapproval for what I'm doing means nothing. Pulling the iron back, I admire the work I've made of Osef's stomach. There isn't much time he has left to remain breathing, and he knows it. I'm going to kill you anyway, Osef, I tell him with no urgency. I'm killing you for no other reason than what Gleb found with you when you were caught. So if there's any last words, anyone you want to implicate in what you've done, you should do that now. And finally, the beaten, broken, and lying man starts talking. 26. Clara. My steps are heavy, my breathing is shallow, and my memory is in scattered pieces as I make my way from the house to the small shed I haven't set foot inside since I was a child. My father was chained up and tortured, ready to be killed there. His life was finally ended at Abram's hand. Vlad gave the order, but it was Abram and Gleb who were directed to see it through. As I grew in age, I also matured with each life experience. Growing up with these men, understanding what they were capable of, none of this comes as a surprise. However, now there's a chance I have a piece of my past I never knew about, a blood relative who's come looking for me after all this time. Before today... I hadn't realized how much I've missed the connection to a past I've all but forgotten about. I have a family. This changes how I see the world I've come to accept as my own. The sudden and sharp snap of a whip, reaching out and hitting its target, is heard through the door before my hand so much as touches its knob. The man named Joseph, who I know is the one detained, wails out in violent and agonizing pain. As I enter the darkened room, the metallic stench of blood takes me back to another time. My body lurches forward, and I gag as the memory assaults my senses. Vlad is standing roughly ten feet in front of Joseph, levitating the whip as its frayed end brushes the floor behind his booted feet. As soon as he hears the squeak of the door opening, Vlad's head whips around to face me. For as long as I live, with or without him, I'll never forget the malevolent expression on his face. As if a mental snapshot of the monster in motion is taken, it's also forever being committed to memory. His malicious disposition makes up all that nightmares are made of. The hard features of his face, the sweat threatening to fall from his brow, are what little girls envision in the dark after suffering alone in their beds. His eyes, now black pits of terrorizing vengeance, are what bring these same daughters into their mother's bed at night, seeking protection and begging for refuge. His chest rises and falls as he renews each breath with added rage, finishing his transformation from human to beast. And it's not Joseph who Vlad's so balefully casting this shadow toward. In this moment, Vlad's anger is aimed solely at me. His shirt is off, his chest glistening in sweat. His hair is damp, and his face is red. Vlad's shoulders are rigid and tense. I have no appreciation for this man. I don't recognize him. I've never seen him or anyone like this before. Fuck! I hear Gleb hiss as he rushes to my side. As Gleb pushes against my back, wrapping an arm around my waist, Vlad and I remain locked in challenge, eye to eye, Heart to heart, soul to soul. I haven't chanced to look across the room toward the cross I know now binds its latest victim. I fear if I do, I'll not only never forgive Vlad for what he's so far done, but I'll never forget seeing Joseph's near lifeless and battered body. Once I've gathered my courage, my eyes move from Vlad. Taking a breath, I brave a glance in Joseph's direction, blinking slowly, taking it all in. I gasp. The punishment for whatever this man, my uncle, has done is already well in progress. For reasons I can't fully understand, the scene is not only haunting but cruel. Joseph's left eye is swollen shut. The other is blinded by drying blood casually dripping from his forehead. His arms are stretched out at his sides, tied tightly with brown, tattered ropes. One arm is broken at the wrist— the bone beneath the skin threatens to break through. 
His toes drag against the concrete floor, the blood from his still thankfully beating heart is pooling at his feet, and in the center of his stomach, blood drips from burned flesh where the letter Z will mark it for as long as he lives, however long that may be. My legs come out from beneath me. Gleb acts quickly to catch me as I start to fall. With Gleb bracing my back to his front, I mentally recollect the time it took for me to get here. Twenty minutes. This was all the contemplation I needed to weigh what little options I thought I had. To decide if my wanting a piece of my past was more important than my love for Vlad, the love I've grown to recognize having for the man he now is to me. But my concern was not only for Joseph, but for Vlad himself. I didn't want him risking whatever punishment God would rain down for doing what I knew he was about to do. But I'm too late. What have you done? I heavily breathe, already knowing the answer. The evidence is clear. Get her the fuck out of here! Vlad seethes, dropping the whip at his side and reaching for a bottle of water. His large hand crushes the small plastic container as he drinks. What have you done? I ask again, this time my voice rising, chasing my anger with it. Fighting the hold Gleb has around my waist, my hands grasp his arms to no avail. Vlad, stop this! My cries go unheard. From the corner of my eye, Abram steps in from behind the cross holding Joseph. Suddenly I'm breathless, Taken back to years ago, Abram's hair is now grayer, and Vlad's face has grown harder with time. Even Gleb, who silently stood in a dark corner, witnessing the torture exacted against my father, is present for this as well. No! I shriek. Vlad's hand drops from his mouth, and he tosses the now-empty water bottle to the floor. Like Vori, my brother isn't capable of loving a woman before all else— all I've come to believe in the person Vlad's become, the man I thought I knew he was capable of being, is gone. The dragon-like beast, standing here now, puffing his chest, announcing his presence, has broken through from wherever he'd been buried. He'll ruin you, Clara. You're nowhere near experienced enough to handle a man like Vlad. Get her out of here! Vlad bellows, pointing to the door behind me. Gleb's body jerks with me still held securely in his arms. Abram rushes to my side to aid him in getting me to the door. I don't go willingly. Rather, I continue fighting tooth and nail. Twisting and turning in place, thrashing against the men I've come to love, I finally break free. Then I run. As soon as I'm able to reach Joseph, I pull on the rope at one side. He gasps first, his breathing shallow. He winces in pain as shudders of agony break from his lips when I untie the rope embedded into the skin to free him. Stop this. Stop this. Stop this. I have to do something. When I'm yanked up into the air from behind, Abram's voice quietly whispers in my ear, Sweetheart, you promised me you'd stay away. He's right. I did. But I can't let it continue as long as I can do something about it either. All I've ever known to be good in the world has come crashing down, unexpectedly and without mercy. Veni, son of Vlad. Faina, his sister. Mug, sweet Mug, the woman who's cared for him like a mother all his life. Do they know of the monster who sleeps under their roof? Was I so blinded by my vulnerability as a child, my lust-filled haze as a teenager, and then my curious wonder of him as an adult? More importantly, was I so lost as a woman, longing for shelter in a world I've lived in fear inside, that I fell in love with the same monster who provided it? No more death. This has to stop. As I continue to push and pull against Abram, my head turns. Vlad, standing boldly proud but still so angry, whispers so quietly I nearly miss it. Abram, let her go. Abram, not understanding, stops moving us away from the cross, but doesn't do as he's told. What? He gapes. Vlad, Clara can't be in here. Let her go to him. If she wants his freedom so badly, let her give it to him. Once I'm steady on my feet, I run back to where I was. There are no visible beats of life left in Joseph. I'm too late. 
While I'm tearing through the last of Joseph's bindings, Gleb comes to stand in front of us both. Once I have him free of the ties, and before Joseph falls to the floor, Gleb's large body bends. My uncle's breath hitches as he's lifted carelessly over Gleb's shoulder. Take him outside. Lay him out and stay with him until I get there. Vlad instructs. Leave him breathing. Thank you. I sigh in sudden relief. Breathing is good. Breathing means Joseph isn't dead. I don't... My own relief is short-lived. With Vlad's hands balled to fists, he turns his focus to Abram now standing at his side. String her up. I hear him callously demand. As both Abram and I direct our attention to Vlad looking down at the whip in his hand, we gasp in unison, our question the same. What? Tie Clara up to the cross. Vlad clarifies, this time pinning his eyes to mine. Instinctively, I begin to back away, one step, then another, while positioning my hands in front of me to warn off anyone who comes close. The door across the room is open, and there's no sight or sound of Gleb or Joseph outside of it. If I screamed for help, no one would hear. If someone did, they wouldn't dare interfere. Just as I have. You're not fucking doing this, Abram demands in a voice I've never heard him use. Vlad, no, I won't let you. Taking his angry gaze from my terrified one, Vlad turns. If you don't put her up on that cross, Abram, you'll be next. Then I'll be next. Abram quickly argues, stepping over to stand in my view of Vlad. Fuck, I'll go first. My God, you can't do this. No. I barely get out, terror stealing my voice. Vlad shakes his head once. A menacing growl follows. She's asking for a lesson, he quietly conveys. She needs to understand. Vlad, I call next, but no one hears. The two men are left at a standoff, head to head, not eight feet in front of me. My back is to the cross, fear keeping me from turning toward it. String her up, Abram. You're wasting time. I won't do it. Abram takes two steps backward, aiming for the door. Even for you, this... He points across the room without finishing. Vlad's hands continue to fist, his knuckles turning white. Leaning toward Abram, he calmly, collectively, and deliberately instructs again. String her up. Fuck you! Vlad, straightening his pose and glaring with fire, states ever so calmly. Abram, you're finished here. Abram turns his gaze to mine, catching my eyes and holding them with understated fear. In the depths of his, I find a terrifying realization I've never seen from him before. Abram, I whisper, please, don't let him do this. Shut up, Vlad bellows. The crack of the whip flies through the distance between us, missing my cheek by only inches. The terrified shriek from my throat echoes off the walls. I close my eyes. Abram, Vlad addresses again, as quietly as the last. You have exactly five seconds to start moving in one direction or the other. Abram, surrendering to Vlad's order, looks down. The quiet prayer said aloud on his closest friend's behalf is heard just barely. The next one is for me. There will be no redemption for this, Vlad. Abram, no. I plead. Abram continues, turning his gaze to Vlad's. May God have mercy on your soul. Please, no. I beg again as Abram walks to me, then wraps his arm around my waist. My bare feet run over the chilled blood left on the floor, finding it's already begun to dry. Please, Abram. I push at his hands. Not this. I'll go. I'll leave right now, and I'll never come back. I swear. Abram refuses to offer any mercy, no longer giving me any of the gentle attention he had before. His tense body remains unyielding, and for him, I don't fight what's about to happen. If Vlad's going to do what I expect he will, I'd rather Abram do as he's told and then walk away, not having to stand and witness. I'm scared, I confess, 
tears streaking my cheeks as he ties the other binding at my wrist. Vlad is going to kill me. He's not, Abram assures, running the back of his fingertips across my cheek. Do as he wants, Clara. I don't answer. I don't know what Vlad wants, because I don't know this Vlad. You said you trusted me? Abram pushes, stepping back. Trust me now. With my body strung up in tethering knots, I give my weight into the binds. The already bloodied rope burns each wrist, and my back aches with the stretch it's forcing me to endure. My feet hardly reach the floor. As Abram makes his way to Vlad, he says nothing as he turns back to me with eyes so sad I carry the weight of his struggle as my own. I'm okay, I give him through a broken sob. I'm okay, I say again, stronger, and this time for myself. I silently watch the two men, eyes to each other but bodies facing me. Abram speaks first. If I had to choose a life made for you, happiness or sorrow, I'd choose sorrow first, a thousand times over. Vlad's body, as well as mine, winces with the way Abram's expressing his last words so gently and forgivingly. Because once a man truly tastes loneliness and bitterness, he's able to appreciate all the blessings he's been given in redemption for enduring them. Abram, Vlad sternly warns, but what you're about to do. Abram pauses to take in an unsteady breath. You're reaching out to a god you tell me you don't believe in. You're summoning his vengeance. If you do this, Vlad, he'll never allow happiness to touch your life again. You need to go if you're going, Vlad responds. You'll only ever know sorrow, Abram punishes. You'll go back to who you were before you loved her. Before you loved her. A deeply seated sadness causes a harrowing sob to break from my chest. Not because what's about to happen will happen, but because Vlad's never told me he loves me. Those words were never spoken between us, and now they never will be. Not after this. Vlad takes a step back, clenching the whip tightly in his hand. Abram, this is as good as done. With Vlad's parting promise, Abram turns to me, softens his features, and smiles carefully, as though he believes his face will be the last I ever see. And with a heart heavy in loss and full of regret, I believe this too. 27. Vlad I hate you. Clara sneers somewhere between physical and emotional exhaustion. Her blood stains each wrist, caused from the ropes she hangs from. Her body isn't long enough to hold her in one steady position, so she continuously sways in place. Her shoulders are stretched at awkward angles, and her face is red and marred with angry tears. Only fifteen minutes have passed since Abram left Clara and me alone. Her emotions have been all over fear, sadness, and now finally, anger. I was saving an innocent man, she claims. He's my family, Vlad. I heard Gleb say it. Innocent man, no. The whip burns the palm of my hand, as if it also feels the regret of what I'm about to do. Clara must understand her position. For her own safety, she must never forget her place in my bed again, questioning my authority and judgment. Even the means by which I choose to protect her cannot ever happen. The cracking of the whip comes fast and hard. Her screams of holy terror come just as furious when it lands three inches from her face as it was intended. Bringing the whip from the floor and wrapping it around my fingers, I explain. There are things I do that you don't have the right to question, Clara. I've protected you for your own good. No, she sharply denies. You didn't protect me. 
You hid this part of yourself from me. With venom lingering in her tone, she looks down, saying only, I hate you. Anger at her statement, fear that she may mean exactly as she says, and the regret for what I'm doing brings the whip up again before I send it sailing through the air. This time it makes contact, shredding the material of her nightgown near her thigh. Once she's composed herself, she cautiously lifts her head. Do it, she orders, void of all emotion. I want to know what the others, my family, felt when you tortured them. You could have been hurt, I accuse, hovering the whip and then freeing it to land at the bottom of her feet. Another shriek bursts out, but she still refuses to relent. Or you could have been killed. I have enemies, Clara. I bellow. You know this. Beat me, she murmurs as she winces from the pain caused from the restraints. I'm here now, a traitor's daughter. I want to know what you did to my father and my uncle. You don't, I calmly assure. You wouldn't survive half of what they did before they finally told me what I needed to know. Releasing another slice through the air, the end of my whip strikes only inches from her wrist. This time, she doesn't turn to check where it's landed. Instead, Clara lifts her eyes to me in challenge. Do you want me to confess? She sneers. That's why you do this, isn't it? You bring people you say are guilty, tie them up to hear their confessions before they beg for your mercy. Yes, I confirm. That's exactly what I do. Softly, Clara offers, If you want me to confess, I will. I loved you. She loved me. She doesn't anymore. Clara is young. Her alleged love for me doesn't come from my treating her as an equal or sharing quiet times together. Nor is it from hours spent getting to know her as a man should a woman he cares so much about. Her love for me can't be real. For her sake, I hope what she thinks she feels or felt isn't anything of love at all. Pushing through my thoughts, she utters, I used to think you were so powerful that no one could ever hurt me. But a person who can do this to someone? She starts, fighting the restraints and wincing in pain. He doesn't deserve any of the love I have left to give him. I'm still the person you know me to be. No, she denies. My V never existed. At least not as the person I thought he was. Coldly, I urge, I'm the person who wants to protect you. Clara pulls in a heavy breath of anguish. With eyes said and full of remorse, she asks what I've asked myself many times before. But then who is here to protect me from you? Her head drops, but not in fear. If Clara were truly scared, she'd be pleading for her release. She's not. Even strapped with her back against a well-used cross, inside a barren shed without any witnesses of what I may do, Clara has no fear. This demonstration into gutting her disobedience is useless. The door opens. Clara's broken eyes come to mine before shifting to see who's entered. I don't look back instead keeping my focus to her. When her body relaxes in immediate relief, I finally hear who's come. Boss? Ruan quietly addresses. Get her down, I order, knowing whatever point I had to make has been made. Ruan moves across the room quickly. His hands fumble at the knots, and Clara gasps in pain. Take her to my room. Don't let her leave it. Clara's face, realizing what I've said, morphs from relief to anger. Her eyes narrow, and she takes a breath while biting her lower lip. 
She says nothing. The tear marks on her face and the redness in her cheeks have all but faded. Dropping my whip to the cement floor, I lean my body against the wall and watch as Ruan does as I've instructed. Clara clings to him, her arms wrapped tightly around his shoulders. She says nothing to either of us as he carries her back to the house. 28. Vlad As I quietly enter through the back door, I find Abram hasn't left as I thought he would. He's sitting on the couch, holding a drink in one hand and clutching his personal revolver in the other. When he lifts his eyes to mine, he pales. The anger he held earlier is gone. In place of that is pity. At this point, I don't know which is worse. I can't decide if I want to shoot you and end your miserable life or sit back and witness you suffer alone through the rest of it, he calmly states before bringing the glass to his lips. Dropping the bag I had carried to the shed, I exhale a heavy breath. If you wanted to kill me, Abram, I'm certain I'd have been dead years ago. Suppose you're right about that, he replies, boredom streaking his tone. Is Ruan still alive? Abram's testing me. Sending Ruan into that shed, uninvited, could have served as Ruan's death. Abram and I both know that. However, what was happening wasn't like any protocol before. Ruan is fine. No, Abram denies. He's as sick as any of us. You sent him in there to get her. I confirm the obvious. She's young, Abram replies, sitting up and placing the gun and his drink on the table. But Clara's soul is old. You've seen to that. All these years with you. Enough, I clip in warning. In a voice low and full of loss, he ignores my order, stating only, The girl's been gutted. Have you spoken to her? He runs his hand through his hair, then tells me, No, I imagine she wants nothing to do with anyone in this family anymore. You don't get to be pissed. Pissed? He tenses, then mock laughs. Vlad, I'm not fucking pissed. Abram. My tone is warning again as I sit on the couch across from his. The leather is cool against my fevered skin, but it does little to lessen my heated disposition. Once Ruan cleared Clara from sight, I wasted no time in destroying the small room until my body tired and I gave up. I left behind broken bottles, upturned chairs, and gaps in the walls that were split against my fist. My beautiful girl wasn't only done with me. She'd left me entirely. And even if I were a man willing to forgive so easily, I can't. Not until I know without a doubt her lesson has been learned. She can never be part of my business, never interfere as she did again. What you did to her was completely over the top, Abram counsels. Christ, Vlad, there were other ways of explaining, showing her the dangers of her position in this family. What I did was my decision. It was he answers quickly, and it was irrational. I won't justify anything to you or anyone else, I tell him honestly. Not letting this pass, Abram states again, irrational. I sit in silence. My position within this family doesn't warrant the explanation of my choices to protect it especially choices I make regarding those I care so deeply about. Ruan did as you told him and locked the girl in your room. So now what? You plan to keep her there forever? I plan to keep her there until she understands. Good luck with that. 
She thought she had a family. Clara did exactly what you would have done had the same happened to you. There's truth in his observation. If someone were to threaten someone who I believed was my family, I'd have done as she did. However, I'd also fully expect the same punishment in return, but worse. Grabbing his glass, Abram throws the rest of his drink back. When he sets it down, he questions, What will you do with Osef now? Gleb and Leonid are handling the mess. Clara will never forgive you. She doesn't have to, I assert. She earned every bit of what she got, Abram. Clara still has no idea what she was walking into tonight. Osef wasn't harmless, as Abram initially thought. He was dirty, a liar and a cheat who planned to take Clara from me. If it hadn't been for my decision to torture his body until his confession leaked from his soul. You strapped the first woman you've ever really cared about to a cross, Vlad, Abram gravely recalls, the memory obviously still taunting him. What the fuck were you thinking? I need to find the mark, I explain. She needs to see to Clara. Abram laughs again, controlled but mimicking. Mark, that poor woman is in a state. I went to check on her. Fuck me, but I've never seen a woman shake as badly as she was. Guilt settles in my chest. Mock cares about both Clara and me a great deal. Hearing of what I did to Clara most likely wounded her deeply. I'll talk to her. Abram stands. I stay seated. Leaving Chiro out of this, as I imagine you're already thinking of revenge, I need to know what you want to done with Katrina. Katrina, as I learned, is now working closely with Chiro. I haven't verified this firsthand, but the ramblings of a near-dead man gasping for his last breath may not lie. Katrina is harmless. I'll decide what she gets when the time comes. That whore hates Clara. She always has. I'm done, Abram. I halt. No more tonight. As he passes me, he stops and looks down. I meant what I said back there. Every goddamn word. Sorrow, Vled. You've tasted it. My God, you've lived without real happiness your entire life. Until Clara. I wasn't sure you'd ever get your own piece of something extraordinary. But you did. Now I can only hope that sharing a small part of happiness with her hasn't escaped you entirely. Abram, this had to happen. It didn't, he objects. It's not often he disagrees with decisions I've made in business, but he and I both know this wasn't only about business. This was about family. Clara is part of this family. Once Abram's standing at the front door, he holds the handle and turns in place to say, If she speaks to you again, please give my condolences to Clara. She lost the man she loves today, no question. You're not dead, Vlad, but she's lost you all the same. 29. Clara Osif is dead. Abram says hesitantly. Abram's words are empty, as meaningless as everything he said before. When I look up, he's leaning his back against the wall of Vlad's bedroom. His arms are positioned over his chest, and his ankles are crossed. He's wearing the same clothes he left me in last night. Traces of a dead man's blood mark the collar of his white shirt. His hair is must, sticking out in every direction— and the sorrowed look of absolute disappointment isn't for Joseph's death. It's because of what I did. Where were you planning to go? 
he carefully questions, nodding to the suitcase at my feet. The same suitcase I'd frantically packed and planned to use sits open and still empty. After my furious frenzy of stripping all my belongings from Vlad's closet, I'd thrown nearly everything I owned to the floor. As I started folding my clothes, tears streamed from my eyes, running down my face and dropping to the floor, taking every good memory I've ever had living here with them. My wrists ache. The blood has dried, the skin starting to bruise. My shoulders burn from being trussed up, leaving me powerless to stop Vlad from a cruelty I knew he was capable of, but never expected to be used against me. Just as quickly as I plotted my escape, my plan was derailed, not because I couldn't find the strength of... 26. Clara. My steps are heavy, my breathing is shallow, and my memory is in scattered pieces as I make my way from the house to the small shed I haven't set foot inside since I was a child. My father was chained up and tortured, ready to be killed there. His life was finally ended at Abram's hand. Vlad gave the order, but it was Abram and Gleb who were directed to see it through. As I grew in age, I also matured with each life experience. Growing up with these men, understanding what they were capable of, none of this comes as a surprise. However, now there's a chance I have a piece of my past I never knew about, a blood relative who's come looking for me after all this time. Before today, I hadn't realized how much I've missed the connection to a past I've all but forgotten about. I have a family. This changes how I see the world I've come to accept as my own. The sudden and sharp snap of a whip reaching out and hitting its target is heard through the door before my hand so much as touches its knob. The man named Joseph, who I know is the one detained, wails out in violent and agonizing pain. As I enter the darkened room, the metallic stench of blood takes me back to another time. My body lurches forward, and I gag as the memory assaults my senses. Vlad is standing roughly ten feet in front of Joseph, levitating the whip as its frayed end brushes the floor behind his booted feet. As soon as he hears the squeak of the door opening, Vlad's head whips around to face me. For as long as I live, with or without him, I'll never forget the malevolent expression on his face. As if a mental snapshot of the monster in motion is taken, it's also forever being committed to memory. His malicious disposition makes up all that nightmares are made of. The hard features of his face, the sweat threatening to fall from his brow, are what little girls envision in the dark after suffering alone in their beds. His eyes, now black pits of terrorizing vengeance, are what bring these same daughters into their mother's bed at night, seeking protection and begging for refuge. His chest rises and falls as he renews each breath with added rage, finishing his transformation from human to beast. And it's not Joseph who Vlad's so balefully casting this shadow toward. In this moment, Vlad's anger is aimed solely at me. His shirt is off, his chest glistening in sweat. His hair is damp, and his face is red. Vlad's shoulders are rigid and tense. I have no appreciation for this man. I don't recognize him. I've never seen him or anyone like this before. Fuck. I hear Gleb hiss as he rushes to my side. As Gleb pushes against my back, wrapping an arm around my waist, Vlad and I remain locked in challenge, eye to eye, heart to heart, soul to soul. I haven't chance to look across the room toward the cross I know now binds its latest victim. I fear if I do, I'll not only never forgive Vlad for what he's so far done, but I'll never forget seeing Joseph's near lifeless and battered body— once I've gathered my courage, my eyes move from Vlad. Taking a breath, I brave a glance in Joseph's direction. Blinking slowly, taking it all in, I gasp. The punishment for whatever this man, my uncle, has done is already well in progress. For reasons I can't fully understand, the scene is not only haunting but cruel. Joseph's left eye is swollen shut, the other is blinded by drying blood casually dripping from his forehead. His arms are stretched out at his sides, tied tightly with brown, tattered ropes, 
One arm is broken at the wrist. The bone beneath the skin threatens to break through. His toes drag against the concrete floor. The blood from his still thankfully beating heart is pooling at his feet. And in the center of his stomach, blood drips from burned flesh, where the letter Z will mark it for as long as he lives, however long that may be. My legs come out from beneath me. Gleb acts quickly to catch me as I start to fall. With Gleb bracing my back to his front, I mentally recollect the time it took for me to get here. Twenty minutes. This was all the contemplation I needed to weigh what little options I thought I had. To decide if my wanting a piece of my past was more important than my love for Vlad. The love I've grown to recognize having for the man he now is to me. But my concern was not only for Joseph, but for Vlad himself. I didn't want him risking whatever punishment God would rain down for doing what I knew he was about to do. But I'm too late. What have you done? I heavily breathe, already knowing the answer. The evidence is clear. Get her the fuck out of here. Vlad seethes, dropping the whip at his side and reaching for a bottle of water. His large hand crushes the small plastic container as he drinks. What have you done? I ask again, this time my voice rising, chasing my anger with it, fighting the hold Gleb has around my waist. My hands grasp his arms to no avail. Vlad, stop this! My cries go unheard. From the corner of my eye, Abram steps in from behind the cross holding Joseph. Suddenly I'm breathless, Taken back to years ago, Abram's hair is now grayer, and Vlad's face has grown harder with time. Even Gleb, who silently stood in a dark corner, witnessing the torture exacted against my father, is present for this as well. No! I shriek. Vlad's hand drops from his mouth, and he tosses the now empty water bottle to the floor. Like Vori, my brother isn't capable of loving a woman before all else. All I've come to believe in the person Vlad's become, the man I thought I knew he was capable of being, is gone. The dragon-like beast, standing here now, puffing his chest, announcing his presence, has broken through from wherever he'd been buried. He'll ruin you, Clara. You're nowhere near experienced enough to handle a man like Vlad. Get her out of here! Vlad bellows, pointing to the door behind me needed, but because when I checked the door, it was locked. Locked from the outside. I had no way out. Vlad's bedroom is on the second story of the house. Even if I thought I could climb out of the window, one slip in the fall would kill me. The gutting realization of this, coupled with the notion that the man I once loved is the monster I've always known he could be, sank heavily in my chest as I collapsed to sit still for the first time since all this started. Get out, I murmured to Abram, further tainting the already stifled air between us. Abram doesn't move. Pulling himself from the wall, he straightens and then takes two steps toward where I'm now sitting on the floor. Abram, I said get out. I forcefully try again. Did Vled tell you who... Joseph was? Closing my eyes, I shake my head. When Vlad came to our room last night, he said nothing. I heard his breathing, felt his presence, as I always do. I was too angry to acknowledge I was awake. The palpable tension rolled off him in waves, crushing the air between us. Did he tell you what Osef was going to do to you? Shaking my head again, I look up. He didn't tell me anything. So you have no fucking idea what could have happened to you had Vlad not done what he did. Maybe you could explain it. Bending down, resting his weight against his calves, Abram does. That man, Osef, the man you tried to save, he wasn't your uncle, Clara. What? Angrily, Abram shakes his head and takes in an agitated breath. No. Vlad had him talking. Before you busted in where you didn't fucking belong, Vlad listened to the man confess, in gruesome, sordid detail, about what he planned to do to you. He wasn't my uncle? Shaking his head and scoring me with another disappointed glare, he states, No. 
he was to give you to Vled's enemy. No, I deny in a faded whisper. I didn't have family. I didn't have a soul to save, Vlad's or otherwise. I believed something that I wanted to believe. You would have been as good as dead at the hands of any of Vled's enemies. Angry at the visual of being bound or beaten, I snap, rearing my head back and gaining distance from Abram. Look at what he did to me! I cry out, pushing my wrists in front of him. Wouldn't whoever had taken me have done the same? Vlad didn't fucking hurt you, Clara. You're angry, but it's for the wrong reasons. Fuck you! I spit. You're no better than him! Abram's face reddens. I never remember a time when he's been so angry at something I've created. Abram's held a special place for me, a place where I've always felt comfortable. You did something last night that no one has ever done. Oh, yeah? I mindlessly reply, looking down at the mess on the floor. What's that? You questioned one of the greatest men I've ever known. You made him act in a way even I've never seen. And I've seen a lot of shades to Vlad. Comes with the job, I suppose. I smart. Abram grows more annoyed at my tone. I'll leave, he clips as he starts to stand. But first I need you to hear something. No, I reply. I've heard and seen enough already. Stop acting like a spoiled child, he chastises. Be grateful that you're still here, in this home, and as always, you're still being protected. Shaking my head, I keep my chin low. My fingers twine the hem of an old dress sitting in front of me, carefully weaving the ends of the material between them. I haven't always liked my boss, he starts. I don't look up as he continues. A man like him, as powerful and strong, doesn't understand any true limits. That makes him dangerous. My body jerks with a mock laugh. But dangerous to others, never to you. Abram asserts, finally lifting my gaze to his, my eyes narrow. He abused me. Your superficial wounds will heal. He hurt me. He's hurt you before. It only hurts more now because you know he cares for you. He broke my heart, and it hurts more now because you care for him. Why do you stay here? I question. If you know what he's so capable of, why do you help him? I've never truly wondered why Vlad's men have always remained so loyal. He's not a nice man. He acts with pain, violence, and death. Surely there's so much more to him to be able to earn the allegiance of so many. I'm here because deep down, Vlad is a good person. And he deserves the happiness you gave him a glimpse of. I don't believe that. The things he does to protect you and his family don't change the person that he is. Doesn't it? I question, giving Abram my eyes and attention. He's killed. He's sold women. He's not a good man. Take him or leave him, sweetheart. But Vled is yours just the same, Abram puts simply. As he moves to stand, he says at the same time, That's if you still want the ogre. I see by the looks of you that he didn't harm you when he could have. And technically, Clara... He absolutely should have. He had every right. My mouth drops open as Abram looks down. His eyebrows are knotted in subtle irritation. The irritation is directed at me. You shouldn't have gone where you weren't invited. You promised you wouldn't. You challenged Vlad, and it wasn't your place to do so. As I motion my hand to object, Abram moves his between us to keep me quiet. Vled does what he does without having to ask anyone's permission. You witnessed this tonight. I hope you'll never witness it again. I won't witness anything like that again, though there's not a lot I can do to change my circumstance without leaving those I love. I refuse to bend on my belief that beating someone, no less killing them, is a hazard in this life I'm willing to accept. You're free now. I'm leaving the door open. I've been instructed to let you go. Free, I mutter quietly to keep from laughing. You're obviously angry, he tells me. In time, that anger will ebb. I'll tell you, Clara. 
Your world is what it is because of him. He's always provided for you. He's always protected you. For that, he doesn't need your forgiveness, but he deserves your respect and understanding. 30. Two weeks later. Clara. Ruan? I call, gaining his attention as I stand at the main bathroom entrance. Since the door was open and the light was on as I passed, I turned my head to find him fixing his hair. I've never seen him give himself this careful of attention. Lucky for him, Ruan's always been naturally attractive. Boyish, with a rough edge. Looking from him to the mess he's made on the bathroom basin, I question, What are you doing? Turning to me, he blushes. Timidly, the man I've come to love like a brother quietly confesses, I have a date tonight. My eyes widen. I make no move toward him, but raise my brows with surprise. Ruan doesn't date, although over the last few years he's gotten older and wiser to the ways of young women. His confidence has grown. This has led him to be not so much of a serial dater, but much to my disappointment, a serial player. Last year I'd been down with a cold for days and wasn't sleeping. When I went downstairs to get medicine from the kitchen, I found Ruan and a girl he swears wasn't but three years older than him in the throes of raw and brutal sex. Thankfully, he'd been behind her, bending her over the couch. I didn't see any parts of either of them I shouldn't. However, I have an imagination, and the image has been burned in my head ever since. Sick or not, the next day I had a sit-down with Ruan where I explained women like the one he was with don't sustain the tests of relationships. He seemed to ignore my advice and go about his way. Looking at him now, I'm hoping maybe some of what I said took. You have a date? As in, you're taking a girl out, just the two of you, on purpose? Smiling, lending way to his amusement, he gives me a view of his perfect white teeth. Yep he answers. Turning in place to face me completely, he stretches his arms out wide. How do I look? Taking in his clothes, slacks, and a nicely pressed pale gray button-down shirt, I smirk at his sock-covered feet. You're not wearing tennis shoes with that, are you? You're not helping, he errantly snaps, turning to check his hair in the mirror again. Leaning my shoulder on the door, I ask, what's her name? Adeline, where did you meet her? I ask, fearing his answer to be along the lines of brothel, street corner, or gentleman's club. As Ruan fusses over with his hair, he answers, Around? This isn't much of a relief. Does Vlad know her? Does he know anything about her? He should. She's Mark's goddaughter. That, Adeline? I admonish. The one and only he answers assuredly. Adeline Winters is a beautiful young woman. Long dark hair, falling in wavy tresses down her shoulders to her back. Deeply accented blue eyes, as well as high cheekbones and full lips I'd kill to have. As a kid, Mock used to bring her in to help us in the kitchen. I didn't like her. She was a spoiled child. Maybe the little snot has matured by now. At least I hope she has. Where are you taking her? Wherever she wants to go, I guess. He shrugs. Oh, Ruan, no. This is a big deal. Surely you've given some thought to what she may want. Did you buy her flowers, chocolates? Turning, he tosses his comb on the basin. He leans his hip against it and narrows his eyes on me. Is that what Vlad did for you? No, I reply quietly. Ruan has witnessed how turbulent my relationship with Vlad has become, but I haven't confided in him at all. I know better. He's the soldier of Vlad first, my dear friend second. I've respected the line in our relationship. Besides, if Ruan knew how things were between his boss and me right now, he'd spend all his energy trying to sort us out for fear he or Vlad would lose me. What do I gotta do? he asks, this is the first date, mind you. Don't expect me to do anything fancy. Have you ever been on a real date before? Sure, he shrugs again. Lots. I mean dates that don't end in the backseat of your car, or, say, in the living room behind the couch? 
giving me his signature smirk, dimples included, he shakes his head. Never will forget that, will you? I can't. Smiling, I step closer and grab his wrist to straighten the end of his shirt over his watch, where he fumbled it through the buttons. In his effort to clean himself up, he hadn't taken the time for the small details. Well, you could stop on your way and pick up some flowers. Flowers are fancy, Clara. Gleb said not to go overboard. Gleb, the forever single father of one. Stop saying fancy and listen to me. Right, go on, he encourages, handing me his tie from the towel rack and bending his neck so I can drape it over his shoulders. Give me your best advice, because you've had one love in your life and never went on a single date ever. You'd be the best option for imparting wisdom on the topic, right? Ouch. Pressing forward and ignoring his sarcasm, I suggest... Take her to dinner. Let her talk. Don't discuss the family either. Make this only about you and her. I can do that. And when you take her home, don't kiss her. What? He snaps, not appreciating that piece of advice. And he wouldn't, being that he's a hot-blooded man-child. He's also taking advice from a 21-year-old woman who's in no position to give said advice, but it doesn't matter. Maybe he'll listen. Why can't I kiss her? Do you care about this girl? Yeah. He mumbles. Ruan, I warn, my voice unrecognizably authoritative. Yes, Clara, I care about her. Shrugging as if he shouldn't be disappointed, I reply, then don't kiss her. Respect her. Rolling his eyes, he covers my hands with his own and messes with his tie. Did Vlad not kiss you on your first date? He queries, catching my eyes in the mirror. Truth be told, to this day, Vlad and I have never been on a date. I've never dwelled on the fact that there's never been romance between us. Until the last couple weeks, I've been satisfied with the passion Vlad and I always share. Hey, Ruan calls. What's wrong? Looking at him and feigning a smile, I brush off my self-pity and tell him. You look gorgeous. He rolls his eyes again at the compliment. You say that to all Vlad's men. Nope, just you. I lie. Once he's finished the tie, he turns to me for final pass. I nod my approval, and then he leans down to grab my arms before leaning farther to kiss my cheek. Just as his lips brush my skin, his grasp on my arms becomes painful. The air in the room evaporates as Vlad's dark, hoarse voice echoes in the small room. Get your fucking hands off her, Ruan. Boss, I do it now. Vlad rages. Ruan tilts his chin, and there his eyes meet mine. I hate the loss of his excitement as it immediately turns to worry. I haven't spoken to Vlad at all since he had a Brahm tie me to that cross where he threatened to beat me if I ever interfered with his business again. He's tried talking to me, but I either walk away or stare past him, not truly giving him my attention. Before that night... If he wanted me, all he had to do was take me. Since, he hasn't tried. I miss him. This goes without saying. To this day, I have no idea what Gleb did with Joseph's body, nor have I asked. I'll find you later, I whisper, stepping to the side and giving Ruan room to leave. Flowers and conversation, I whisper louder, this time not caring if Vlad expresses a reaction. Ruan says nothing his expression remaining blank, and he doesn't chance another look when he steps around me to leave. I note he's careful not to touch me as well. This gives way to the murderous expression Vlad must be holding at my back. Once Ruan's clear from the room, Vlad grabs my waist, roughly pulling me to him and pinning my back to his chest. Seething, he brings his mouth to my ear and hisses, Ruan isn't to ever touch you. Rolling my eyes, knowing he can't see, I sigh. You'll talk to me sooner or later, Clara, he claims, reaching to the hem of my dress and lifting it until it meets my upper thigh. His fingers burn against my skin as my anger continues to rise. The longer it takes for you to give in, the less patience I'll have left. And then what, Vlad? I clip, staring at the bathroom floor. You'll punish me again? Tie me up? Whip me? 
This was the wrong thing to say. Before I finished speaking, Vlad's body tenses. The rigidity of his hold strengthens to the point of pain. When I wince, Vlad turns me in place and pushes my body against the basin. My lower back echoes in pain, but I keep my lips drawn tight, refusing to give him satisfaction. He reaches to the nape of my neck, where he roughly fists my hair and tilts my head. Face to face, mouth to mouth, he threatens. If chaining you up and beating you like I did that man whose only purpose was to hurt you is what you want, then ask me nicely and I'll see it gets done. Fuck you, I whisper, fear falling away to anger. I hate you. Speaking to him this way hurts, but I've been pushed too far. You hate me? He repeats, pushing himself into me, pressing his rigid cock into my stomach. You don't hate me, beautiful girl. You want me. And when I'm driving myself into you again, you'll admit it, and this, whatever it is you think you're doing, will be done. Whatever it is I'm doing is my decision. Isn't that what you said to me? My decision? And until I'm ready to forgive you, I won't. I have needs, Clara. A sliver of pain crosses my chest. I know what he's about to say. If you don't take care of those needs, another woman will. The sliver of pain tears open, splitting itself into a deep gash of agonizing hurt. Do it, I test. The intensity in his eyes, the abrasiveness of his voice, the addiction to him I've always had threatens to break. Taunting me, he questions, I'll be leaving to visit the stable. Would you like to come with me so you can watch me fuck another woman because you won't let me fuck you? If you don't give yourself to me, Clara, that's what I'll be forced to consider. Another woman. You wouldn't take a whore. I deny, remembering when he swore to me he'd never do that. Yes or no, he demands. You promised me. When his mouth sucks the flesh of my neck and his hand lifts my skirt, traveling around my waist and below my panties, he squeezes my ass hard and lifts me to the counter. I don't move for an escape. I wouldn't make it past him, and my challenge would infuriate him further. If Ruan's mouth or anyone else's touches you again, blood will spill, he frighteningly informs. His and yours. You're an ass, I state. However, this time I push further. This is your fault. Our end was your fault. At this, his head rears back. If I thought the monster within him was enraged before, the fire set in his stare now pales in comparison to whatever I've seen. Without a moment's notice, Vlad reaches between us, unbuckles his belt, and with a swift flip of his wrist, he pulls it from his pants. Admittedly, I fear this. A long time has passed since I've ever felt threatened. Even being tethered in that shed as my father once was all those years ago, I didn't sense immediate danger of Vlad's temper. The belt drops the buckle breaking the tense silence against the floor. His hand moves back, this time drifting beneath my skirt. I hold his gaze, accepting his challenge. He won't rate me. He doesn't have it in him. He'll threaten to, though, and he'll lose. Angry or not, I'd give myself to him before I'd ever let him live with the thought that he physically violated me. You'll let me touch you, he grinds out, bracing his hands on either side of my body. Using only his waist, he spreads my thighs and steps between them. His hands wrap around my back, bringing me to the edge of the basin where he thrusts, his carnal needs so much stronger than his will to deny it. Remember what I told you the night you found me in the kitchen? He questions, moving the material of my panties aside, but stopping his fingers just outside my entrance. When I offer no reply, he continues, You fixed my hand. I told you that you had no reason to ever be afraid of me. I remember, I admit. I also remember later you promised you'd never hurt me. I haven't, and I won't. Pushing on his chest, I tell him, You already did. His finger slides inside, and my eyes close at the abrupt intrusion, not because it's painful, but because, as always, my body reacts to his touch. Careful, cautious, loving or painful, vicious and rough, each always exciting the lustful longing hunger. You don't hate me, 
he argues, surging his finger in and out of me, then using his thumb to manipulate my clit into surrendering my body to submission. You fucking miss me. Your body wants this. No, I lie. Lowering my head, my eyes focus to his other hand as he unbuttons and unzips his pants with precise determination. The round head of his bulging cock, so remarkably beautiful, comes free before he strokes the tip with his thumb. Damn it, he's right. I have missed him. Terribly. In the dark. Whether he's by my side or not, I miss him. Open yourself to me. He coaxes gently, leaning in and kissing my neck, still using his fingers at my core. Thrusting himself into his other hand, my insides clench around his fingers. My beautiful girl, he mumbles despairingly, biting and then sucking behind my ear. Take me inside. At his words, my so far unwavering reluctance folds. Lifting my head, tilting my face toward the ceiling, I do as he says and spread my legs farther apart. Using both hands, he grasps my legs from behind and jerks me forward to the very edge of the basin, where he wastes no time in driving deep. Frantically and with angry thrusts, he pushes inside me without care. As though he's so thirsty for what he's missed, he drinks from my mouth, twisting and turning his head, using his tongue to explore every inch. I start to sway in place, my body locking on the edge of orgasm. Vlad thrusts one final time, releasing into me with a savage moan so loud it echoes off the narrow walls, piercing my ears. Once he's finished, his body shudders, and then he's gone. Gone. I sit alone, in a haze of shock and surprise, as he adjusts himself in his pants, bends down to grab his belt, runs his hands through his hair, and then walks to the door. Before making his way through it, Vlad turns in place only to threaten, I meant what I said, Clara. If Ruan's mouth ever gets anywhere near your body again, I'll string you both up to that cross, and my whip won't be aimed to miss its target. 31. Vled I see you've managed to fuck up just about everything since I've been gone. Faina sullenly comments as she steps out on the deck, sliding the heavy glass door closed behind her. You made it home safely, I see, my other, testing my sister's spirit after the probable wear and tear Vori put on it while she was away. Faina's been gone only a couple months, but it's the longest we've ever been apart, other than, of course, when she disappeared for nearly a year. During her time away, we've hardly spoken, with all that's progressed or was progressing between Clara and me along with Faina's new life being forced on her back in Russia, and how we left things between us before she left. Neither one of us has extended an olive branch toward the other. Life as we've always known it has taken a toll on us both, but in different ways. I had Stefan pick me up from the airport. I just got in. Apparently I've walked myself into a minefield. Your men are scattered. Gleb is the moodiest I've ever seen him. Leonid won't talk at all, and Abram is nowhere to be found. What in the hell have you done? What have I done? Such an open-ended question, considering I've not spoken to Clara in weeks. Not in the way we used to speak, anyway. After she let me have her, and then leave her as I did, I've avoided her entirely. I used her body against her. I turned her attraction to me into betrayal. I've all but decided she'll never be in my bed again. I could force the stubborn woman into submission, threaten her for not listening to my reasons for doing as I did. However, that would cause the static between us to worsen. So, to answer Faina, I'd only be causing her more worry. Sit down and keep me company, I invite, pointing to the chair next to mine, then pulling a cold beer from the cooler, Mock had the Ruan bring out hours before. Vlad, Faina calls, garnering my attention. 
When I look up, my sister is standing above me, her face a cloud of confusion. Her hands are behind her back as she leans her body on a rail next to my resting feet. Your disappointment in me reeks. For fuck's sake, I can smell it on you, I state. Don't start lecturing so soon after you've gotten home. I wasn't going to lecture you. No? Shaking her head, she smiles. No. Then what's on your mind? You are so bad with human beings. Not just women, but all of us. She tisks. You show more affection to these dogs than to the people who live here. She signals to Maximus sitting at my side and scowls. His ears point to the sky in reaction to her scrutinizing glare. Meridius can't be bothered to move. That sounds like the start of a lecture, Faina, I warn. I don't have to explain all you've done. You already know. I do, so I don't give her another moment to rehash it. Sit, I tell her again. I'm getting married in five weeks, she announces, grabbing the proffered bottle from my hand. Twisting the cap, she continues. To a man I don't even like. Thomas will be good for you, Faina, I object. Vori told me he likes you. He likes me, she hisses, leaning in to get close from where she sits in her chair. My God, big brother, he's twenty years older than I am. He has gray hair and wrinkled skin. He's experienced. He's a dinosaur. He's secure. He's a brute. He's who our father chose for you. Our father is an idiot. This one single conversation is taking all my energy, and she's just gotten home. Then there's you, she starts in again, this time not in the jovial voice from before. She's outright angry. You have the love of a good woman, a woman who would be loyal and faithful to this family until the day she died, tossing her hand in front of her, signaling to all our property ahead, she tells me, She belongs here. In your life, and you've ruined her. Lifting my drink to my mouth and surveying the area she's focused on, I also comment for good measure, just as you were afraid I would. No lie there. I didn't want you with her. I wanted to protect her. I know. I should have listened. You were right not to. You made her happy. You believe this now? What's changed? Lifting the bottle to her mouth, Faina stares out into the expansive yard and sighs. Thomas is what happened. You were happy with her. When I talked to her on the phone, her excitement was sickening. I want that for me, too. I was wrong to try to take it from you. Ask her if I make her happy now. I add with sarcasm. You scared the hell out of her with that barbaric scene, she admonishes. She told you, I surmise. Of course she did. Sighing again, my sister sits back in her seat. With a hand not holding her drink, she lifts her hair, piling it on top of her head. She told me you didn't hurt her, but Jesus, what you did was extreme even for you. It was necessary. No, Faina pouts. Not at all. Does Thomas want children, I question, carefully changing the subject. Faina turns her head. Her nose scrunches and her eyes narrow. I don't want kids with him, so what he wants doesn't matter. We'd have to make those heathens together. Who the hell arranges marriages anymore? This is ridiculous. You'll do as father wants. You don't have a choice. He's coming here after the wedding if he can get away. Mom is worse than she ever was. She's so much more detached. He's worried about her. However selfish and unfair my feelings toward my mother, I'm thankful she is the way she is. With her being so dependent on my father, he'll have less time trying to keep my dependence on him. Gleb mentioned you're taking a trip. 
You're leaving in a couple days. I am, I tell her, heading down south. I want to look at a few of our houses personally. Faina doesn't need to know. I'm also going straight north to meet with Killian Dawson. This time, we won't meet in public. No attack, likely. I'm convinced that Killian has things yet to say, and I plan to propose a gentleman's agreement between us. Leonid is more than capable of going in your place. It's what you really want is to get the hell away from here. I'm focusing on what I should have been focusing on all along. That's an excuse, a cop-out, she utters quietly. Fix this with Clara, brother. If you don't, you'll end up alone and unhappy. I won't. You'll end up hating everyone again. Faina, you'll end up... Lifting my hand, I tell her, Faina, you're lecturing. Loving a beautiful woman like her won't kill you, Vlad. She presses without delay. But the heartbreak that comes with losing someone so beautiful will. Narrowing my eyes, I question, and you know so much about that? Shaking her head, Faina drops her gaze to her lap. No. The silence between us is wrapped in what I fear is a well-kept secret. Before I have a chance to prod, the back door slides open. Clara's smiling as her eyes hit Faina first. Her hair is down, blowing in the cool breeze. She's wearing a light sweater and faded jeans. When she recognizes who sits at Faina's side, her smile drops. A sharp pain hits my chest. I didn't know you were busy, Clara claims, taking one step backward into the house. Faina stands. I'm not. My sister turns to me, and her eyes widen, beckoning me to do or say something. I refuse to budge. Whatever Clara and I talk about, and whenever we do so, isn't anyone's business but our own. I can come back, Clara states. Faina places her beer on the cooler between us and doesn't offer me another glance. Turning to Clara, she states, I was just leaving. Let's go. 32. Clara Against the brightness of my bedroom light, my eyes immediately open and then close. And as I wake from another restless sleep, I try to remember where I am. My body jolts when it's lifted from the bed and sent sailing through the air. Landing hard against Vlad's warm and bare chest, I open my mouth to scream in protest. Thinking better of not wanting to wake the others, I whisper in a hiss, What in the hell are you doing? Vlad uses his foot to hold my bedroom door open as he carries me out into the hall. The memory of being trapped in this same spot with Mok, Ruan, and Venny staring at us together holds me quiet. I don't want to gather any witnesses for whatever Vlad is planning. Shut up, he snaps, keeping his focus to moving forward. It's time we talk. I don't want to talk to you. I lie. Only hours ago I sat alone in my room, fully aware of where Vlad was headed in the morning. My stomach churned with doubt. Visions of Vlad having sex with a whore in his hotel room corrupted my thoughts. Over the course of the last month, I've cast Vlad aside pushing him out as best I could. Then, as he left me in the bathroom days ago, my resolve began to wane. I've had time to think, to try and understand why he did what he did. The only reasoning I've come up with is that he did it all for me. Good you don't want to talk. Maybe for once you'll shut up and listen, he states. As Abram had explained, the man he murdered was going to hurt me. His motives weren't about family— only about material. I was the collateral he needed to get something he didn't already have. Money. And a place in Chiro Pileshi's ear. Vlad protected me once again from the grotesque world I have no desire to venture out into alone. Not to mention, I've missed Vlad. I've missed us. Well, you could have talked in my room. I mumble with petulance, finding the comfort of his arms more soothing than I'd like. Clara, hush. He clips again. Vlad kicks open his bedroom door, 
He sets me to my feet, where I straighten the black lace nighty I'd chosen tonight to sleep in. With only his bedroom lamp on, I cast a quick, unobtrusive glance around his room. Vlad's books are stacked on his small bedside table. His worn clothes are strewn throughout the floor. His dresser is cluttered with this and that. Muck hasn't been in here at all. Apparently not for weeks. Oddly, I note, this must be driving our dear housemaid close to crazy. Taking a quiet seat on the edge of Vlad's bed, I chance turning my gaze to his. With his chest already bare, Vlad's fingers sort through his belt before starting on the buttons of his pants. He leaves them open but makes no move to take them down. In a civil tone which masks my nervousness, I ask, Why have you brought me here to talk? Tell me you understand why I did what I did, he demands, and that you'll never interfere in my business again. Rightfully, by his condescending tone alone, I want to smart back. I don't, because, after accepting all the advice Abram gave me without my consent, I've come to realize what I did was wrong. Questioning the means Vlad uses to protect those he cares about was a misguided mistake. The problem is that I haven't let go of my pride and explained all this to him. Vlad, Clara, tell me. Say the words. Crossing my arms over my chest, I narrow my eyes. The corners of his mouth lift and the rigidity in his posture wanes. Secretly, I've come to believe Vlad enjoys the challenges I give him. We can't talk if you don't let me speak. If you have something to say, I'll listen, he tells me, coaxing my submission. I have something to say. I have more than enough to tell him, so much to explain, and once I do, Vlad will either understand or he won't. I fear if he won't, I'll be sentenced to more nights without him next to me. More mornings I'll wake up alone, full of sadness and regret. I start with, I shouldn't have interfered. No, you shouldn't have, he replies. Widening my eyes, I return. You're interrupting. Vlad's expression warms while he closes his mouth. Looking to the floor, I study his booted feet. Dear God, I've missed all of him. Even the trivial memories of how we once were have been left to taunt me. It's possible I'm about to go start a war, Clara, he states, with the family who's been at my family's back for decades. Chiro is playing a game of cat and mouse. What you did could have cost me finding out information that I needed to use against him. I know, I whisper, feeling the subtle but heavy weight of guilt. And if you remember, not long ago I was shot at, as was Abram, who suffered because of it. Vlad, I know this too. Vori is livid, he continues. With me? With Faina? He wants bloodshed for what's been done. Are you? Pushing forward, Vlad points out. I don't want Vinyamin involved in any of this. If we're not careful, someone else I care about could be hurt. A target like you were. The weight of an unfair world sits heavily on Vlad's shoulders. I've added undue stress to everything he's already trying to manage. Your entire life you've lived here, in this house, Clara. But you haven't lived with me. The second you let me have you, everything you thought you understood about your place in this life changed. I understand I do, I assure. And I'm sorry. Pressing as if not hearing my confession, he continues with, You can't do what you did ever again. And the next time, I can't be as lenient as I was. He's right. Faina had told me what a woman in Vlad's life means to his enemies. I'm a pawn for negotiation, now considered a living weapon in his home that his enemies want to destroy. The notion may sound outrageous, but that makes it no less true. Okay. Okay, he replies. Seeming to have reeled in his agitation, Vlad takes two steps in my direction. My back tenses, and I crane my neck to look up at him. Every brutal but beautiful feature of his face is the same. His green eyes, his shadowing light brown hair, the power of his disposition, the strength of his broad chest, 
His fingers caress my cheek, moving down to the line of my jaw. The gentle touch acts as a balm, soothing over the space that's been between us. The depths of his contemplation are nerve-wracking. So much has taken place between us, I'm no longer sure where I stand in his life, if I stand anywhere at all. With my eyes growing thick with unshed tears, I beg, tell me what you're thinking right now. Without hesitation, Vlad admits, I'm thinking how much I've missed having you look at me the way you are in this moment. I swallow. Vlad's never been one of sweet gestures. And I'm thinking how much I've missed hearing you say my name when I'm inside you. God, I've missed that too. I don't reply as Vlad bends, grabs me beneath my arms, and lays my body flat against the bed before covering it with his own. Beneath my gown, Vlad's hand travels up my stomach, slowly sliding between my breasts. My nipples peak with long-awaited anticipation. My core burns, wanting its fill of him again. That's what I'm thinking, he tells me, lifting his hand from me and adjusting his pants to position himself at my entrance. The anticipation turns to pleasure as his finger glides across my clit over my panties circling and then adding pressure again and again. I'm so sorry, I tell him again, having his full attention. Startled by the torturing tear of my panties, I feel Vlad's chest move up and down as he tries to control his breathing. I've made him happy in succumbing to his demands, and my promise is never to interfere again. Driving deep, he enters me without warning. A feral moan breaks from his lips, and he pulls out only to re-enter just as hard. His eyes meet mine, holding my gaze steady as he rocks into me, thrusting without mercy and hungering for more. My body tightens, urging him on, pleading with him to give me everything he has. His mind, his heart, his soul, his love. Raising my head from the bed, I straighten my neck and my lips draw near his ear. I love you. I whisper what I know is true. In reaction, Vlad's body stops its motion. He doesn't return the endearment. I hadn't expected him to. His cock pulsates before he thrusts again. Then, on the third, Vlad empties into me with a carnal moan of pent-up release. Following him, my thighs begin to quiver, and I go in search to find what was almost lost between us. The connection hadn't been completely severed, all this time I've been away, I wanted this back. My body is spent, and my mind is tired. Finally, even before he has a chance to disconnect, the fear of losing him again, for any time at all, takes over. 33. Vlad This certainly isn't how I pictured the inside of one of your operations to look like. Killian notes. Scanning the richly decorated room where several of my women are walking and talking with potential customers. What had you pictured? Abram questions as he sits on the couch at my side. We don't run brothels. The old man laughs, bringing the tumbler of scotch to his lips. Before drinking, he replies, I've never had a need for the services you offer. I'll say I'm impressed with the variety of women i found here. If I were looking for one, that is. This location is by far the smallest of our stock. Tempra is run by a single woman. Ilda is older, far past her own prime, and is considered professional in every sense. When at the last minute Killian backed out of our coming to see him, I was adamant that Abram and I come this far north. Coming here saved Killian from being caught by Chiro and fraternizing with the enemy. Chiro's stupid, but even he couldn't find a place like this if his cock were trying to lead him into one. Are all of your houses similar to this one? Abram laughs at my side, answering Killian's question in my place. Vled has always had expensive tastes. Liquor and women alike. All of our houses are like this, but most have a larger menu of women to choose from. 
Gillian's expression grows pensive. I know his take on the sale of flesh, and had hoped by him seeing what I actually do with said flesh, that he'd gain a better understanding of how my family cares for these women. We're not in the business of peddling humans overall. We're out to make a profit just the same as the professional whores who use their bodies. What's on your mind, Killian? I ask, cutting through the silence. Why did you ask to meet? He's up to something, Killian voices, his tone low and full of unmasked concern. How do you know? I thought the two of you didn't speak. We don't. However, there's a man inside who, unlike Chiro, understands family is more important than anything else in this world. Business or not? Your grandson, Abram guesses. Liam. Killian gives no indication if Abram's hit the mark or not. Abram's guess would make sense. Liam is the obvious choice. That young man is the only link that ties both families together. There was a woman of yours, Killian addresses with disgust. Katrina. Marx, Abram finishes. Katrina Marx ran one of our houses, but she's no longer employed by our organization. Right, Killian returns. Now she's part of Chiro's. Giving Killian information of what I already know could be dangerous. Trusting a man connected to Chiro could potentially cause more harm to everyone involved, including him. However, after having Osif coming to claim what he said was his, and doing it with Chiro's backing, I don't have a choice but to share. I know enough about Katrina to believe she's harmless. You're so sure of this? Killian questions. I'd be more sure if you'd agree to rally against Chiro with me. Together, we'd have no problem putting him where he belongs. Killian's face falls to worry. If I were to do this, Liam could potentially suffer. Liam is an adult, my friend. He's starting his own life. Do you not want him away from the hands of that madman? Sternly, Killian advises, I can't get involved yet. You're already involved, Abram puts in. By coming here, you're already choosing sides. And it's the right side. Killian lifts his hand toward Abram to accept the photograph I asked Abram to bring. It's the picture of the contents Osef had with him the night we found him near the house, each item more grotesque than the one before. Killian studies the photo. The ashen color of the old man's face turns red. He was going to hurt Clara, Abram states. And you can see by the items in that picture that he was going to make her suffer by his hand or by giving her over to the Peleshis. Dear God in heaven, Chiro, what have you done? Killian whispers to himself. Sitting up in my seat, I place my drink down on the table and rest my elbows on my knees. I watch as Killian fingers the edge of the picture as he thinks. What if Osef were planning this for your wife, your child? Would you be willing to walk away then? No, he replies, but doesn't look up. But in a way, Liam is my child. And if you all were to destroy Chiro, Liam could get caught in the middle. I can't let that happen. No more than you can let Chiro walk away from this attempt against your family. My woman, I hiss. Clara Kosliev is mine. Katrina knows this. As does Chiro now, I'm sure. Killian assumes. Yes. Give me time to think, Killian requests. The time for thinking has passed, Abram retorts. If your answer is no, we have nothing else to discuss. You don't know if Chiro is planning anything beyond the help Osef had asked him for. No, I don't. I'll ask this of you, then, Killian asserts. Give me time. Enough to try and talk to Liam. 
If I can get to him. His loyalty is to the Pleshi name, not Dawson. He's loyal to no one. He's young, but he understands more than you'd believe. Time, then. I reluctantly agree. But if Chiro breathes a breath in my direction, Killian, I'll ruin him for good. And it'll be too late to worry about your Liam as I do. 34. Vled. Are you planning to ignore me all night? Clara's voice pulls my attention from work. When I lift my head and find her standing in the doorway, she smiles. Her arms are wrapped around her waist. She's holding something tightly between them. She's also wearing the nightgown I insisted she buy during our last shopping trip in the city. Clara said it was too much, swearing her small frame couldn't do the gown justice. But looking at her now, she couldn't have been more wrong. My beautiful girl makes the gown beautiful. Ignore you? How would that be possible? Clara smiles wider, knowing my return is true. It's late. Can't you sleep? Pulling her shoulder from the door jam, she takes a step closer. I could, but I'd be doing it alone. I missed you. What do you have? I inquire, pointing to her hand. Rolling my chair back two feet from my desk, I open my arms to Clara as she steps in close. Mark insists you need this for your desk. She gave it to you as a gift, but said you wouldn't accept. So she gave it to me, so you would have to take it. Accepting the frame, I look down to find my Mark is so insistent. The picture is of Clara. Standing with Veni, as Abram's daughter, Alina, plays in an open area of sand at a park I don't recognize. Clara's wearing a pair of two short denim shorts and a yellow State of Arizona t-shirt. My son is wearing his usual tattered jeans and faded tee. Clara's smiling down at Alina as she tosses sand in the air. Veni's not smiling at all. Ah, so mock. Thought the gifts should be in here, I jab. Not you at all. Shaking her head, Clara folds herself into my lap, her back to my front. Her bare legs tangle with mine as she sits up to find a place on the desk for the gift. Moving things around, she places it near the lamp and directly in my view. I thought since you spend more time in here than in bed sleeping with me, or doing other stuff to me, that I agreed with Mock. This is where the picture should be. You know, just so you remember. Sitting back, Clara rests the back of her head against my shoulder, then emits a contented sigh. Her hands find mine, and she pulls my arms across her stomach where she clutches them tightly to her. It's late, Vlad. Come to bed, she nags. I have work. I return. I won't be much longer. You've said that before. Yes, I've said many things before. You don't listen to many of them. You know, we could all take a trip, she pushes. To, say, New York. To visit your family. I've never been there. I'd like to meet the cousins Venny's always talking about. Since we've been together... I've been careful to keep Clara as far away from my family as I've been able. My father is still bitter, completely against my relationship to a woman who carries a traitor's blood within her veins. He'd think that, given the way Clara and I started. My uncle, on the other hand, is merely concerned that my focus has slipped and that I've moved on with more interest in building a family of my own versus garnering and caring for this one's growth and prosperity. None of their thoughts or feelings matter. Since the blessing I asked from each of them never came, Clara won't be exposed to their blatant disinterest in her, and when I make the decision to marry the woman I've come to care about, they won't be asked to make an appearance there either. So, you miss me. I kiss the soft skin of Clara's neck and feel her softly shudder. And that's why you came down here at this hour? 
Yes, she confirms, dropping her hands to cover mine. Her back arches when my thumb caresses her skin in small circles, slowly making my way between her thighs. Should you show me how much you miss me in my office, I offer, or in our bed? Twisting her neck, Clara kisses me softly. Her tongue darts out to taste my bottom lip. You're playing with fire, my beautiful girl, I remind her. Spreading her thighs wide, Clara braces the pads of her feet on the floor. From over her shoulder I look down and take heated pleasure in the contours of her chest. Her nipples, tight from excitement, brush against the material of her nightgown. Touch me, Vlad, she quietly demands. My fingers dig into her flesh, a warning for her to brace. When she grasps my thighs at either side, I start my approach, and my body rocks as my finger makes contact with her bare pussy. Clara's intention in coming to me was this and only this. You're playing me, I hiss, my fingers spreading her before finding purchase against her already swollen clit. Rolling over it slowly, her body grows tight and her neck tilts against my shoulder. Her eyes close and she takes in a breath. So fucking beautiful. Tilting her hips, she attempts to take away my control, setting the pace for herself. I pull my hand from beneath her gown. She huffs in protest. Stand up, turn around, and face me, I instruct. While she does as I've told her, I free myself from my pants. Clara grasps the edge of the desk as she spreads her thighs, opening herself in front of me. The smell of her arousal penetrates. My cock pulsates with every breath. Lie back on the desk and offer yourself to me, I demand. Once she climbs up, I grab her foot and place it on the edge of my chair. The other follows without my direction. Her bare cunt glistens from my view. Sitting back, I run one finger from behind her knees up her thighs again and again, until they begin to tremble. Tell me why you came in here. After clearing the desk behind her, Clara lies back, stretching her arms above her head. Her body grows more taut as my finger explores her wet and silky core. In and out, I watch her intense reaction to my touch. Vlad, she breathes. Please, tell me why you walked in here like this, dressed in this. Oh, God, she murmurs, bowling her hands to fists as I circle her clit and then position my finger at her entrance. With my other hand, I stroke my shaft up and down, again and again. Surrounded by all that's her, my own touch is threatening. Say it, beautiful girl. Tell me what you want. I want you to fuck me, Vlad, she demands, twisting and writhing against my palm. In her frantic attempt to find a steady anchor to the desk, the picture frame falls, landing on its front with a clink. Standing, I run my hand over her taut stomach. Between her breasts, I press down to keep her position, and without warning, I give her exactly what she came to get. My cock. This is what you want, I accuse, pulling out quickly then thrusting into her as deep as I can get. Yes! She wraps her legs around my waist, her heels digging into my back. Her neck strains as her head tilts back against the desk. The veins protrude in protest. Her mouth is open, gasping for breath and I drive into her without mercy. Her insides tighten, grasping my cock with more greed than before. She's close. Beg me to let you come. Clara's head comes up, her chin meeting her chest as her narrow eyes meet mine. Her most always stubborn dispositions would be amusing if I weren't so close to coming undone. No, she whispers. I won't beg. 
You will, I promise, bending to tear her gown and expose her chest. My mouth leches to her breast, and I suck it in fast and hard. My finger rolls over her clit, my cock pulsating with impatience inside her. Standing again, I look down. Her eyes are no longer narrowed, but reflective. Seeing her spread out, willing to do whatever I ask, I stop. I've been too rough. I'm treating her like a whore. Clara's eyebrows furrow. Vlad? Come here, I call, holding my hand out to help her up, while at the same time sliding out of her. Once she's standing, I walk her back to my chair. She follows closely behind. Sitting down, I twist the chair to face her. Her eyes widen when I sit, pants open but not off, cock out but not satisfied. Grabbing her hand, I bring her to me. Ride me, Clara, slow and sweet. With careful consideration, Clara brings herself to my lap. With slow, sweet, absolute fucking torture, she finds her unhurried rhythm, holding my body tightly to hers. I love you, she whispers in my ear. And you don't have to tell me you love me right now. I already know you do. 35. Vlad Gillian Dawson was found dead outside a no-name bar downtown. His body was lying next to a dumpster. Abram's voice is unrecognizably wounded as he voices the grave news over the phone. Single gunshot to the head, Vled. He'd been on his knees. This wasn't a random homicide. This was an execution. Jesus Christ. He had everything with him. Keys, wallet, driver's license, and money. No, I vehemently deny his words. Killian was. Killian was young. That's what he was. He burns further. No blood on his hands. No signs of struggle around him. Just one shiny bullet to the brain. God in heaven, Abram. I'm not wrong with this. Someone had been looking for him. This was a hit. A professional hit, I convey. Who would be stupid enough to carry out a hit on Killian Dawson? I have no idea. Weeks have passed since I met with Killian at Tempera. I haven't spoken to him since that last meeting, where I encouraged him to align with my organization to get rid of Chiro once and for all. Does anyone have proof who could have done this? Not that it truly matters anymore. A man is dead. A life's been taken. A family is in mourning. At this very moment, Killian is most likely holding his broken wife in his arms and begging God to somehow give his last but now lost son back. Not yet, Abram answers. But from the way it sounds, as fucked up as it sounds, all of this could blow Pileshi's way. Their family, I remind him. Surely Chiro wouldn't be so stupid as to kill a Dawson. To get what he wants from Killian? Abram abruptly returns. He would. What a better way to position to take over what the Killian still controls than to expose a weakness heart-rending enough to keep him busy for a good long while. Abram's right. The strongest weakness of any man is found at the heart of his family, and Killian Dawson of all people holds his wife and son closest above all else. Striking against a man by murdering his own blood can certainly make him weak. This malicious act of cruelty then invites others to pull apart whatever they can, and as fast as they can do it. We'll proceed with caution from here, Vled, Abram strongly advises. The women, Faina, Clara, even Mok, shouldn't go out alone. They'll hate the fact they're being tailed, but I know you agree it's best. Yes, I do agree. 
to both the protection and the resistance it'll undoubtedly be met with. Too long of nothing. Not a word has been heard from Chiro after Osef was taken down, he comments quietly. All of this has been torn to shreds with a bullet to the brain. Whoever it was, Chiro or not, they weren't messing around. I need you to do something for me, I request. Add the families of my men to the list of those to be watched. Whatever is needed, Lucy and Alina are as much my family as you are. You know this. I'll get on the boys when I'm off here. Everyone will be covered by tonight. At any cost. Any cost, he returns. Are you already thinking on whether or not you should attend the funeral? I hadn't thought that far ahead. However, Abram has a fair point. I should go and pay my respects. I'll find out when the services are. Irish or not, Killian is a respected acquaintance. Yes, I acknowledge. Betsar Pileshi will be there. Fuck Chiro Pileshi. Even a man of his disgrace, a man who could have had Killian killed, will be respectful enough to offer familial peace in the time of mourning. If I'm wrong, I'll hope his being able to gloat in the face of a mourning family will keep him from bragging about his intended gesture and ruining them. Besides, with Killian's entire liege of men armed with weapons angry at the loss of one of their own, Chiro would be an even bigger fool to think he'd win a battle against wolves waiting to drink the blood of their enemy. You should take Clara, Abram suggests. Won't hurt if she meets Erlina. Even while she's grieving, Clara's sure to be a balm to some of that hurt just by being the woman she is. I'll ask. If she'd rather not, I won't push. Smiling through his words, Abram returns. If she'd rather not, are you being funny? When does Clara not want to be anywhere you are? Abram. I exasperate. Enough. If Lucy followed me as much as Clara follows you, nothing would ever get done. This is true. Off subject, Abram questions. How's Clara doing anyway? I smile. Something I've done a lot more of over these last couple months. She's good. Glad to know she's still putting up with you, he jabs. I don't fold to his goading, but repeat, she's good, Abram. Enough. And Faina? he asks next. How's she doing? Busy, I respond. She's due to leave soon. She'll be going back home to get married. Never thought I'd be alive to see the day that woman took to a man. Ultimately, our father has made my sister's decision for her. When I spoke to her last... She irately informed me that she was going to run away unless he permitted her to come here for a visit as often as she feels she needs. She misses Clara and Venny. I understand that, and I supported her decision against Vori. He complied, if only to assuage, the holy terror that is Faina. Back to business, Abram says, I'm going to dig deeper into whatever Kilian was up to before last night. If Killian weren't considered an ally, I wouldn't. But this whole thing stinks, and it smells like Pileshi. Call me when you have something to share. Call me when you have an invite for Mox Beef Stroganoff, he smarts. Appreciating his ability to lead a dark conversation to light, I tell him, I'll have Clara call Lucy. We'll let them set something up. Perfect, he agrees. Talk to you soon. Soon. 36. Clara. This is my wife. Killian gestures to the woman at his right. Lena, this is Clara. I turn my undivided attention to the woman who's lost her child and the man who loves her so much, his pain for her acts as static between us all. It appears Erlina Dawson, at one time, had been a classically beautiful, blonde-haired, blue-eyed woman of elegant grace and high class. Age, 
Or maybe time spent as the wife to a man as powerful as Vlad explained Killian to be, has worn her down. The mere fact she buried her son not two hours ago serves as a snapshot into her life with the Irish king. Rather than accepting my extended hand, Erlina reaches for my shoulders and pulls me into her. Her lips lightly brush against my right cheek once before moving in to kiss the left. She'd done the same after being introduced to Vlad, even though the two had never formally met either. Thank you, she tells me quietly, then adds, for coming today. I can't imagine this is how you'd choose to spend your Sunday afternoon. I'm so sorry for your loss, I express with deep sincerity while squeezing her hands in mine. Vlad speaks highly of Killian. We're so sorry for you both. Tears plague her eyes. She turns into her husband's waiting arms, burrowing herself into his side. Killian curtly nods to Vlad before turning her away and leading them back out into the room of waiting people. Are you all right? Vlad queries, moving the hair from my shoulder and running the backs of his fingers against my cheek. No, I'm not all right. The ride to the church had been quiet. Vlad had been left in worried thoughts in regards on how coming here would go. After the service concluded, we followed the procession of cars, mostly black SUVs with tinted windows, back to the Dawson's estate. Lavish with forest green landscape, the Dawson home sits back from everything, far removed from any other home in the area. The circled driveway was full of running cars with women stepping out their doors to make their way inside. As they passed into the house, all mourners were being greeted by the open arms of both Erlina and Killian. I'm as good as I can be, I assure. I'm sad for their family. Killian was loved, Vlad comments, and no amount of love can bring him back. No, I agree, and his death will always live here, I tell him, looking around the vast and heavily decorated family room. The Irish family is proud of their heritage, paintings of who must be Killian's father, his father's father, and those before him adorn the walls. Tapestries with unmarked Celtic symbols hang next to the pictures. Unlike Faina's love of deep red and overstated black, Erlina has decorated their home in neutrals. The couch, chairs, and even the tables and lamps are colored in varying shades of white. Vlad pulls me close, squeezing my body to his. He feels the sadness as I do. Killian was so young, such a waste of life taken in death too early. Who is that? I lift my chin in the direction of a young man standing alone against the wall near the door. He's not surrounded by those offering him condolences. He's also not wearing weapons, as some of the others. From here I can't make out the name tags stitched into his faded leather vest. His dark, nearly black eyes, framed with black lashes, are scanning the room. It doesn't appear he's looking after the mourners as Killian's men are, but for something else. One of his booted feet is up, resting on the wall behind him. A silver chain hangs from his front pocket to his back. His tatted hands are clutched in front of him, expanding the muscles of his chest beneath the old black T-shirt he's wearing. The faded jeans he has on have holes at each knee. His dark hair is a few inches too long, brushing the collar of his vest, and it doesn't look as if he took the time to groom his face before arriving, or for the last five days. I'll admit he's incredibly attractive, but in a roguish and combative kind of way. That would be Eleventh, Vlad informs. Eleventh? Where's that name from? Looking up at Vlad, I find his grin is mischievous. The name is not from anywhere. He's a member of the St. Justice Motorcycle Club. I've heard of this club. They're known to many for being as ruthless and unlawful as the mobs who surround them. They, however, don't care who knows their business. I've heard Vlad warning Venny many times to steer clear of these men. Thankfully, so far, Venny has listened. Why would a member of a biker gang be at Killian's son's funeral? He's most likely here to watch Chiro's back, in case the idiot steps out of line. Eleventh used to belong to Chiro. What? I don't know the whole story. Vlad prefaces. Years ago... There was a boy I'd heard had come to live with the Pileshis. 
He'd been badly beaten at the time. Chiro's wife, Sophie, insisted they take the boy off the streets, clean him up, and then she insisted Chiro watch out for him. Sophie sounds a lot like Faina, I presume. Hiding his smile, he agrees. Yes, I imagine so. Vlad kisses the crown of my head before he bends farther to whisper. Stay here. Don't move. Abram's watching you from the door. I'll say goodbye to Killian and we'll go. The area around me is filled with women, some sobbing to themselves, some offering a sympathetic smile when my eyes catch theirs. Some appear still in shock as to what happened. Killian's men are easy to identify. Most are strapped with holstered knives and guns. They're standing in corners, keenly aware of every move being made. A few acknowledge others with respect, a small wave of a finger, or extending guests a quick nod. Certainly I'm a stranger, but I've been welcomed into this home nonetheless. As I turn in search of Ruan, my eyes lock on a beautiful man who looks to be close to my age, maybe a little older. His dark suit is pressed, his black shoes are shiny. He's tall, with dark eyes and hair nearly black in color. His skin is tanned. When he catches my study of him, he smiles, revealing beautiful straight white teeth behind a pair of perfectly symmetrical lips. Truly beautiful. Giving him an awkward wave, I lower my eyes and take a breath. By the time I collect myself under his gaze, I look up to find he's making his way to me. Puzzled at his brazenly stated compliment, along with the elegant aura of his presence, I tilt my head. I'm Liam. Liam? Chiro's nephew? He frowns. But I'm also Killian's and Erlina's grandson. Erlina mentioned you'd come today with Vlad. Oh. Years ago, I remember hearing about a boy, lost in the mix between families, a common heir born with a link to one side and the other. Vlad mentioned this to Abram, but I never imagined meeting him, the man who was no longer a boy at all. I wasn't what you were expecting, he assumes, smiling again, true and genuine. I thought you'd be shorter, I falter. I mean, younger. I'm twenty-five. Vlad has a son not much younger than I am, though. The edge of his Italian accent is there, but faded. He does, but little Venny is only sixteen. Little Venny, he smirks. He must hate being called that as much as I hate being called young Liam. He's sixteen, he hates everything, I reply with a mock eye roll. With awkward silence falling between us, I extend, I'm sorry about your Uncle Killian. Looking around the room, Liam runs his hands through his hair. An expression of loss blankets his face, but neither for his uncle nor the reason we're here. I didn't know Killian. If you are with Vlad, then you know how this works. The fact that all of these families are here in the same room, without guns blazing, is a blessing I'll thank God for many times. It's a funeral, Liam, I point out. A time for peace. Remorse marks his tone as he returns, if there's ever that. There's always hope that maybe someday there will be. With eyes much older than his years directed at me, he nods. As I contemplate what kind of life this man has had to make him look that way, my gaze moves over his shoulder. There, I find Vlad standing in front of a woman with long, dark hair. With her back to me, I can only see she's wearing a short skirt, high heels, and that she's leaning toward him with too much familiarity. Vlad is scowling down at her. It also looks as if he's voicing his distaste, leaving no uncertain terms. That's Katrina, Liam answers, turning in place to find what's got my attention. She's my uncle's. At the name, jealousy forms, and I snap. Katrina? She's my uncle's. I know who she is. I clip, keeping my eyes on her. I know what Katrina Marks is. I just didn't know Katrina had moved in on another family in this city. From all I've heard about the Peleshis, it seems she'd fit better there, away from me, away from Vlad. You do, Liam concurs, offering another genuine smile. Then you know she's impossible to please. Not really. Unfortunately, I still remember the many ways Vlad used to please her.
done with this. I should go, I state, extending my hand. Liam accepts, grasps it firmly, and replies, Thank you for being here. For Killian and Lerlina. Liam, say diablo sai facendo. An angry voice calls from behind where he stands. When Liam steps to the side and turns in place to find who's speaking, the man coming at us is short in stature, round in frame, and evil in presence. The old man scans my body, head to toe, stopping at all the intimate places only Vlad has ever been privy to. I feel each pass he makes, each grotesque touch of his gaze. As though reading my mind, the vile man's cheeks redden, a territorial grin crossing his lips. His yellow teeth, coupled with the trail of sweat across his brow, send a sliver of fear up my spine. My heart rate increases at this man's abrasive attempt to make me feel uncomfortable. Whoever he is, not only is he deplorably unattractive, but he's also incredibly rude. Liam clears his throat, pulling our attention from each other. Before I have a chance to inform him as to whom I belong, Vlad's arm wraps around my shoulders and not so gently pulls me two steps back and deep into his side. Warning bells sound off in my head, mirroring a dark symphony before death occurs. Giro, Vlad addresses, his voice deep, low, and hardly restrained. The two exchange heated gazes while I shudder at the name. This is Chiro, the head of the long-standing, ever-failing Paleshi Empire, the man who acts as the Zaleski family's key named threat, Vlad, ignoring Chiro's disgusted expression, turns his focus to Liam. You must be Killian's grandson, Vlad surprisingly guesses correctly. You have your grandmother Dawson's eyes. When I was young, my mom used to say I looked like her, Liam remarks, smiling at Vlad. Liam, come with me to find your Aunt Sophie, Chiro asserts, leaving his eyes on mine. When his gray tongue darts out, tasting his lips with vigor, I step closer into the safety of Vlad's hold. Vlad, seeing exactly what I did, pushes me behind him. I reach to grasp his arm for balance, but it's too late. The dragon fire in his voice gives way to its fight to break free. This day isn't ours, Vlad seethes. Not today or tomorrow. We're standing in Killian's home. He's grieving. Ah, Chiro feigns recognition, as if we're not all standing in the mix of broken hearts and shattered spirits. Well, I should say he is, he tisks. Grieving, of course. Shaking his head, he looks down and mocks. Such a tragedy. Oh my god, I hate him. Before Vlad can respond, Abram appears from nowhere at my side grabbing my arm and pulling me out from behind Vlad. The anger between now three men is palpable. Take her to the car, Vlad demands, not looking at Abram but still focused on Chiro, as if his enemy could strike me dead at any moment using only his venom. Clara, Abram calls. Let's go, I'll walk with you outside. As we leave the men in a standoff, Abram's hand settles at my back. Each step I take, Abram equals never veering from the direction of the front door. That's Chiro Paleshi? I turn to whisper once we're out of earshot of the others. Reaching for my coat, he replies, the one and only. He's testing Vlad. For all that's good and only, I can only pray my boss holds his composure. Today is not the day for bloodshed. My eyes widen. Bloodshed? At a funeral? Now I really hate Chiro. Can we wait for Vlad? No. Abram clips. I need you outside. I want to wait. Clara, he sighs, tilts his head toward the ceiling and says, you're missing the whole point of taking you from Vlad's side. What point? Bringing his head back down, Abram adjusts my coat. You're Vlad's anchor. His anchor? His expression remains flippant. You're the pin that holds the crazy man together. That's the only reason I'm here, isn't it? I ask, figuring out the plan Abram set into motion before we left the house. Smirking, Abram advises, 
That's why I insisted you should come, yes. Vlad relies on you in more ways than you think. He doesn't know you tricked him. I knowingly smirk. I do what I can to ensure my boss keeps a level head at the right time, which is exactly why I insisted Faina stay home and only you come. Faina's mouth would bring chaos. Now, fully smiling, I shake my head and put my hands through the coat at my back. Whispering in my ear, Abram insists, We'll keep this between us. Of course we will. If Abram's plan means Vlad walks himself out of Killian's home in one piece and drives me home with all his faculties intact, I'll keep whatever secrets Abram asks me to. Come on, Clara, he sighs. Let's go. 37. Chiro What you're planning is dangerous. You're talking about the kidnapping a woman, Chiro. Pete freely admonishes. An innocent woman who knows nothing. Chiro remains unaffected. His eyes hold those of his second in command as he watches his breathing grow more labored. Pete's scared of the Russian. Not only kidnapping, Chiro taunts. Murder as well. You have finally lost your mind, Pete clips, standing straight and running his hands through his hair. Jesus Christ. An hour ago, Chiro was sitting in his favorite chair and staring at his lavish fireplace while mentally adding the final touches to a plan he's had all along. Finally, the time has come. Finally, a revenge both strong and worthy enough to strike against the heart of Zaleski, bold enough to cause that heart to stop beating. Ordering the only living son left of Killian Dawson to be murdered was enough to create the division he'd hoped for. Grabbing his drink from the glass table in front of him, Chiro holds it tightly while he explains, You, yourself, have killed before, Pete. You've maimed for me countless times. Both innocent and also the guilty have died at your hand. Tell me why this is any different. Pete's mouth opens, but he offers no argument. Satisfied he's hit home, Chiro sits back in his chair and grins. At the very least, Katrina interjects with a smirk as she sits at Pete's side. If all goes well, we'll rid the city of one, if not all three of them. You're opening us all up to his revenge, Pete states, disregarding Katrina as he usually does. This isn't lunacy anymore, Chiro. It's certain suicide. Think about what you're doing. And all these years of the two of you going at it like schoolboys vying for playground territory, Vlad has never hurt a woman who belonged to this family. Anger floods Chiro's disposition. While it's true Vlad has never harmed one of his own directly, he has ruined his family in other ways. He shattered his business, killed his men, and caused Chiro to doubt his life's purpose. If Chiro had a son of his own, whom he loved as much as he loved what he does, he would compare the heartache to be the same. I have thought about this, Chiro returns quickly. And if Vlad is dead, there's no more revenge to be had. His son, Pete remembers. Then he will lose everything. He'll be a man sooner than you know, and he'll come at you with all of Vlad's build. As Chiro stands, he takes his drink with him, then turns to stare out the window to gaze down at the city he considers his. He admits only to himself that he would have liked to divest Osef, the liar he knew the man was, of more information. However, being that the dead can't talk, he's unable to get more from him. Not if I take with me all that Vlad's built. People can be swayed, Pete. Some even purchased for their loyalty or silence. Vinyamin isn't people, Pete utters. Vlad Zaleski is a roadblock. He's in the way of what I want. One way or another, he'll be moved from my path. But you're not going after just him, Pete jabs. Your target is the innocent. Turning in place, Chiro frowns. Having your second-in-command doubt your genius and strategy isn't only appalling, 
It's as good as betrayal. You work for me, Pete. If you don't agree that what I'm doing is for the good of this family, then by all means find your way out of it. But let me warn you. This will be the last time I hear your worry about any Zaleski. As far as I'm concerned, the name from your mouth is forbidden. Katrina releases a one-syllable laugh. Her happiness is cut short when Shiro turns to her and scowls. The woman who's been in his bed since the day she walked away from that filthy Russian has by far worn out her welcome. She's been nothing more than a leech, liar and shitty lay since she arrived. The time is coming, Pete. Enough talk. Enough threats. Enough. Killian was just laid to rest. Have you no sense of loss? He was your family. Shrugging, Chiro returns. He was my family, but by association only. Striking to the heart of him, Pete includes, He was Liam's family. Liam lost his uncle. An uncle with Irish blood. An uncle he's never known. Killian's broken heart doesn't matter. Pete drops his head, murmuring in Italian. Chiro clearly understands his ramblings as being a prayer, but offers no reassurance regarding his already long dead soul. Pete can pray to whoever may listen, but this is going to happen with or without his best friend's help. Pete looks up. You're right, Chiro. We've all had enough. No way does Chiro believe Pete's conscience is taken to what's about to happen. Pete's always been the voice of reason. His love for Liam's future has always clouded his duties. His care of the innocent always closely held. Katrina, Chiro calls. The cat-eyed woman smirks. Find Liam now. Tell him he's leaving town for a few weeks. Tell him he has business somewhere else. Steer him clear for as long as I need him gone. Where do you want him to go? She asks. I don't care. Make something up, Chiro tersely answers, losing patience with his orders being questioned. It's a lie. You're good at lying, aren't you? Pouting, Katrina stands and brushes off his tone. Anything for you, Chiro? I'll be sure he's gone for as long as it takes. And it won't take long. Not if the plan goes the way he hopes it will. Unfortunately, he'll have to rely on the whore standing in front of him, surveying her red lipstick in a compact mirror. Hardly the time to care about what she looks like on the outside, considering what she's about to do makes her sick in the mind, and abhorrently ugly on the inside. Thank you for thinking about the Liam, Pete mutters. At the least you're thinking about something that truly matters to us all. 38. Vled. What are you doing? Venny queries, walking through the kitchen door. His hair and face are drenched with sweat, and his clothes, which smell of three-day-old sewage, hang like wet rags from his growing body. Work, I reply, sitting back and closing my laptop in front of me. It's been two weeks since Chiro and I met face to face after years of successfully avoiding each other in a public setting. The way Chiro took to Clara, watching her move and licking his chops as the wolf he tries to be, recommitted my cause to destroy him. And if it's the last thing I ever do, I will. Katrina is a whole other story. The woman is now in Chiro's bed, doing as she did during her time with me. She wears his rank of power as her own, doing nothing to earn it. She can sit where she is. The woman will never be a pillar of society, but as long as she steers clear of this family, she's nothing to me. Grabbing an apple from the bowl and tossing it into the air before catching it, Venny snags a generous bite before asking, Where is everyone? Clara is out shopping with Faina, I tell him sitting back in my chair and reaching for my cold cup of coffee. When Clara and Faina explained that they were headed out for a day of shopping, 
I stopped listening. Those two women have been known to gossip while shopping. Both know I want nothing to do with any of it. They left first thing this morning. Stefan is with them. Instinct told me to deny their trip entirely, remembering the harrowing sadness that Erlina Dawson wore as she watched her son's casket being lowered into his final resting place. Attesting to her stubbornness, Clara insisted they go anyway. She wanted time with Faina because my sister sets off next week back to my father. I granted this only because they each promised they'd let Stefan stay close, check in often, and would meet me at Abram's house this evening. My son flinches as though in pain as he comes to take a seat next to me at the table. Why do they shop so much? What's left to buy? Son. All my energy goes into never asking Clara that question. Yeah, I'm not asking her either, he jokes. Don't ever ask why women do the things they do, Venny. Life is easier if you don't. Totally, he smiles. Especially life with Clara. My son is smart. Looking at him up and moving so early on the Saturday morning, I question, You went to the gym before breakfast? He smiles again. I did. Abram and Gleb forgot how old they are. Morning or not, a few of us handed them their asses in basketball. Is that so? I reply, doing little to hide my smirk. Gleb hates to lose, to anyone. But losing even so much as bragging rights to a smart-mouthed young man like Venny must have hurt his fragile and aging ego. Yep. Gleb got pissed and demanded a rematch. He called Ruan for backup. Didn't help. Ruan's good, but not nearly as good as the rest of us. This evening is little Alina's birthday party. I remind him again. You'll be there. Lucy is looking forward to having everyone together. Pouting, he asks, How long do I have to stay? Long enough to make an appearance. Sighing with relief, he agrees. I can do that. Good. Now let me work. I have a question, he poses, placing his half-eaten apple on the table and sitting back in his chair. My son has grown tall. He's nearly as tall as me now. He doesn't have the thickness of my build yet. But with as much time as he dedicates to the gym, I don't expect he'll be too far behind for long. I do wish he'd cut his hair, though. He wears it too long, too shaggy. I've noticed some of his friends as they come and go throughout the house. They were theirs the same. What kind of question? A uh, female question? He replies. Venia Min, although sixteen, has surprisingly never asked me anything that pertains to women in general. Other than his curiosity of why they do the things they do, of course. I've thought at times that maybe he was going to Abram or Gleb, being they are probably more subtle in their advice. Not to mention they both have more patience than I do. Go on, I carefully prod. Clearing his throat and straightening his posture, he asks, The first time you asked Clara out on a date, did she say yes? Seconds pass. I have no answer for this. For the first time in my life, I'm utterly speechless in front of my son. Not to mention, it's only just now struck me that I've never taken Clara out on an official date. Not that she's ever complained. Clara and I didn't have a simple start to our relationship then. You know this, I know. Right, I do. But I mean, when you decided you wanted to pursue her... He jabs, knowing my aggressive nature as well as everyone in the family does. Did she say yes? Son, I sigh. Is there a question about you we're getting to? Smiling, he gives another right. A word I'm finding is a staple in his vocabulary. The response being not a response at all. Well? There's a girl I want to ask out. And if she says yes, great. But if she says no, it'll piss me off.
Now I smile. Venya Menzaleski is definitely my son. It'll piss you off because you really like her or because your feelings will be hurt. Because I really like her, he admits quickly, his eyes darkening as he does. I've known her for years. She's pretty and funny and smart. Then I think you should ask her. But I'll advise that if she refuses, keep your head. Like you do with Clara? He smarts. Because I'm thinking you don't always keep your head with her. Yes, well, we both know Clara. And we both also know she can be a challenge. You like that about her, he insists. I do. Vanny and I have never discussed how Clara and I finally came to be together. In the beginning, Clara told me that showing affection in front of the others felt awkward. I disagreed and made it perfectly clear to her and everyone else in this family that Clara was mine, and that we'd push forward without questions or doubts. My son loves her deeply. He respects her. Thus, once getting used to the idea of the two of us together, he took no issue with the change. Dad, he calls. When I look up, I find Vinyamin's expression serious. Are you ever going to marry her? Yes, my son holds the utmost respect for her. Make an honest woman of her, you mean? Is that your question? No? Maybe. He shrugs. I don't know. Are we talking man to man, I ask, or am I talking to you as Clara's best friend? Then he stares at me for a long moment, blinking slowly and considering my question carefully before deciding, both. Man to man, I haven't given it much thought. She's happy, and that's all I care about. As her best friend, he pushes. Smiling, I rest his worry. As her best friend, I'll tell you that I've thought to marry her, but there's a lot to go with that. Vori, then he sneers. He doesn't like Clara. Yes, my son is not only so much like me in the ways of women, but he's also like me in the ways of men, namely my father. Your grandfather refuses to acknowledge Clara as part of this family. He refuses? Dad, he's an asshole. Who cares if he refuses? He doesn't know her. He doesn't even try to get to know her. Vanny, I warn. You know how this family runs, and why it continues to run. Vori has vested interest in all of us. Yeah, he agrees with a curt nod, which is why I never want to be a part of how it runs. Vori has been pressuring me to bring Vinyamin on board full-time in lieu of him seeking a formal college education. Call it fatherly protection or my instinct in knowing Vori is up to no good. But I fought that battle with Vori, and I would have fought it to the death to win. Luckily, I did win, and without bloodshed. He's approved Veniamin to attend a college of his choosing. However, he quickly insinuated that over the course of those four years— Veniamin is to decide which profession he'll be assisting the family with upon graduation. Winning one battle with Vori was a momentous success. Two in the same year would be highly unlikely, so I decided to let it go. Don't worry for Clara. Things happen the way they happen. Nodding, Veni stands. I need to shower, and then I gotta make a call. You're going to ask this girl out over the phone? Well, yeah. Son, I smirk, looking up at him as he heads to the door. Even I know that's no way to get a woman to say yes to a date. Jesus, Dad, how old are you? I'm not asking her to marry me. A phone call is easier. Thinking better than my own advice, I offer, Clara will be around later. She could help. Um, then he hesitates. You're the only guy Clara's ever dated. How's she gonna help me? Good point. I still suggest she's a woman, 
and she's not much older than you are. I laugh when with wide eyes my boy utters, For fuck's sake, Dad, don't remind me. Just talk to Clara, go make your call, whatever. Just do it out of here, I'm working. Right, he replies, turning in place while I cringe in my chair. Right. 39. Clara. How late are we? Faina questions, tossing her numerous shopping bags on the black leather couch. She doesn't care how late we are. If she did, she wouldn't have insisted she stop for that second gourmet coffee on the way home. Late, I reply, rushing to set my own bags down in a neat pile on the floor and noting the house is quiet. Mock must have already left. Checking the clock on the wall for the first time, and then my phone for messages, I wince. Faina and I chatted, shopped, and enjoyed the unseasonably warm weather, like two old women who hadn't seen each other for decades, and we did this much longer than I promised Vlad we would. The fact I called as promised, never once being late to check in, had Stefan never far away, won't matter. I'm sure he's already angry. Alina's seventh birthday party is today, and Lucy is throwing her one big enough to rival my twenty-first. I smirk at the image of Vlad's broody face, scowling at all the little kids running back and forth through a Brahms yard, screaming for no reason other than they're allowed, wondering which is driving him crazier, the boys or the girls. I clasp my stomach and smile to myself. Are you going to tell my brother tonight he's going to be a daddy tonight? Faina asks, turning in place to sit. Please tell him before I leave. I want to witness the baby daddy's reaction for myself. She lands on the comfortable cushion with a dramatic sigh before kicking the shoes off with her feet. Yes, I plan to. Do you think it's a bad idea to tell him so soon? Laughing, she points to the bag of baby clothes I had Stefan bring inside first before he and another of Vlad's men went to check the perimeter of the house. I think if you don't, you'll have some serious explaining to do. No one buys that much stuff at a baby store. Did you see the look on the cashier's face? I'm pregnant. At 14, Faina took me to the doctor, and I was given birth control to regulate my periods. With everything that's happened since Vlad and I began, I hadn't been as faithful in taking them as I should have. This is on me, and I plan to explain this to Vlad when the time is right. After I'd taken the third pregnancy test yesterday, I was so thrilled. All I could do was look in the mirror, lift my shirt, touch my belly, and watch the tears of happiness stream down my face. I never thought my life would lead to where it's at, and, married or not, whether he's warm to the idea or not, Vlad and I are going to be parents. I'll tell him tonight after he sees me wearing this. I lift the new gown I bought to my chest. It's a see-through black lace short piece I secretly purchased while Faina was busy browsing the others. In mock disgust, Faina raises her hand to cover her eyes. Please, Clara, if you love me, you'll put that thing away. No sister wants to imagine what her brother will be stripping off his woman, who also happens to be her best friend. Laughing, I do as she asks and quickly shove it back in the bag. I need to shower. Faina rises from the couch, looking at all she bought. She purchased things for nearly every member of our family and nothing for her own family in Russia, including her newly named fiancé. Walking to me, Faina's eyes dance in excitement. Her hand moves to my still-flat stomach, and she smiles. I'm happy for you, Clara. This baby will be beautiful, even if it's half fled. Faina was the first person I told. When I did, she hugged me so tightly I could hardly breathe. Her excitement reassured me that everything was going to be okay, and Vlad would be just as happy as she was. My eyes missed with happy tears. Faina. Leaning toward me, she wraps her arms around my shoulders and pulls me in for a tight hug. I close my eyes, accepting her comfort. You're going to make a great mother. I know it, she whispers. Congratulations. That's when we hear the vast array of bullets coming from the side of the house. 40. Vlad. 
You don't know that anything has happened yet, Vlad? Abram clips, walking two steps in sync behind each one of mine. You know Clara and you know Faina. Both can test the restraint of even the most patient man. When Clara didn't arrive at the party by the time she said she would, I imminently sensed something was wrong. When I called her phone, she didn't answer. When I called Faina's, she didn't answer either. My orders were specific and clear. Even with Faina as her guide throughout the day, Clara wouldn't have left me waiting and concerned about her safety. Dismissing Abram's attempts to calm me, I walk into the house to find the lights are all on. Nothing appears misplaced or even out of the ordinary. Several bags from their shopping trip are piled on the couch, also lining the floor next to it. Clara's purse is open, and her shoes lie forgotten near the door as if she took them off the moment she made it inside. Faina's belongings are left mingled around just the same. They've been here. But when? See? Abram puts in at my side. They're here. They're safe. Knowing those two hens, they're probably drinking wine on the deck and just lost track of time. Nothing to worry about. No, I deny. Clara would have at least called to tell me they weren't coming. No matter how annoyed she knew I'd be in the result of her blatant disregard for time, she'd get in touch to tell me when I'd be with her again. Where's Vanny? Abram asks. His car is outside. I'm here, my son announces, rounding the corner from the kitchen and meeting us at the front door. He's dressed down, in pajama pants and an old ratty concert tee which is so faded the emblem has been lost with wear. The girls, Clara and Faina, have you seen them? Were they here? No, I haven't seen them, he answers, looking around at all their things. I heard someone down here about an hour ago. I assumed they'd finally gotten back. I was in my room and the music was on. I didn't hear anything else. Grimacing, I grab my phone. No texts and no calls. Fury and fear churn my gut. Venny takes a step toward us, his eyes scanning the area as ours did. The look on his face now mirrors my own. Dad, what's wrong? What happened? Turning to Abram, I order, Stay here with Venny. I'll check the rest of the house. Sighing, Abram runs his hand through his hair. Vled, calm down. Check the house before you give yourself a heart attack. Dad? Venny's usual jovial tone falls to immense worry. They were here, I know they were. Stay with Abram, I demand before walking away. Thirty minutes later, the house has been searched. There have been no signs of either Clara or Faina. Abram's contacted the others, and they're all en route to meet here. Faina wouldn't do anything to put Clara in danger, Abram comments as if reading my mind. My fucking sister. If she's done anything to put Clara in harm's way, I'll truly wring her neck. Vlad, Abram questions, pointing to a yellow paper bag filled with God only knows what. What is it? I don't have time to. My words trail off as Abram raises the bag in the air. A small but worried smile spreads across his lips and his eyebrows arch in avid attention. Your woman has been keeping secrets. If not your woman, then it's Faina who has secrets. Not Faina. Not possible. If either of the two is pregnant, it's Clara. Holy fuck, Dad, Venny whispers. Is that... I mean, did you know? The stork on the front of the bag lends to the obvious hint as to where the women shopped today. As Abram pulls out a yellow blanket, followed by a yellow pair of infant shoes, my heart sinks. My beautiful girl is pregnant, and she hadn't even told me. I don't take the time to process what all this means to either of us. 
but the urgency to find her increases. Looking out the large bay window that covers the entire front wall of the room, Abram drops the bag and announces, The men are here. Ruan is already armed. He's worried for Clara, I assert. Gleb must have told him what's happened. Nothing has happened yet, Vlad, Abram assures. However sly he thinks himself to be, I turn my head to catch Abram standing above the bag wearing a frown. His hands move to his hips, and an almost silent prayer falls from his mouth in the name of my unborn child. Where the fuck are they? 41. Clara. Wake up, little one. A woman's familiar voice hisses in my ear. I try to blink, but my eyes are forced shut, closed by a dark blindfold secured tightly around my head. My already darkened vision blurs as cold water unexpectedly slaps me across the face. When I try to move my hands to clear the water and take a breath, I can't. They're tethered together above my head. The smell of an old and used mattress circles in the air from beneath where I'm lying. My legs, spread out and tied at the ankles, are numb, likely from lack of blood. My head throbs in painful beats in time with the panic of my racing heart. The voice I hear belongs to Katrina Marks. Although the memory is fuzzy, I remember bits and pieces. I'd been home. I was talking to Faina and worried about being late for Alina's party. Then, as I held her tight, our bodies simultaneously jolted when we heard gunfire close by. A few short moments passed before I caught a shadowed glimpse of a large man coming toward her. It was then that my vision went dark— Faina's voice screaming my name through a loud shrill was the last I heard from her. The single punch to my face didn't knock me out as I assume it had her. I could still hear voices, make out words, and listen to all that was being said between them. She goes to the warehouse, a man's raspy voice stated. I assumed in the fog of my mind he'd been pointing to one of us. She goes to Xavier. He venomously continued, our once-clean living room reeked of stale smoke and dirty bodies. The sounds of the men, moving together as they incoherently mumbled, faded in and out. Rather than challenge whoever had overtaken us, I stayed quiet with eyes closed as we were carried to separate cars waiting outside. I waited with bated breath for Stefan to make his presence known. I hadn't thought something happened to him, as well, until now. With the pain in my head too much to bear, I still prayed for both myself and my baby's safety. I realized then that I was acting as an expectant mother, protecting her child from those who could harm it. Do you remember me? Katrina's voice, sounding manic, sneers in my ear. Do you know who I am? Yes, I answer quietly, my voice raspy and almost inaudible as my throat is too dry. Pay attention, Clara, she demands, slapping my cheek so hard my head turns to the side where I met with a large, cold, and calloused hand that squeezes my jaw with so much force it aches even after it's freed. Katrina's fingers brush down my stomach, continuing on until she stops between my thighs. Thankful I'm wearing jeans rather than a dress, I exhale a heavy breath, but she doesn't stop her sickening assault. Her hand shifts to my waist, where she begins to work the button of my pants. Calm. I need to stay calm. You really are beautiful, she longingly whispers, her face drawing closer to mine in order to lick the lobe of my ear. When she bites down hard, I jerk the bindings and yelp in surprise. She sucks the flesh into her mouth with a venomous pull before saying, That Russian bastard loves you. Oh, God, Vlad. The last time he heard anything from me was to tell him that Faina and I were finally heading to Abrams. We'd been running late. He was angry at us both. I had hoped once he knew where we'd gone and why, he'd be as excited as I was for the baby. You think he'll come for her? Another voice, this time a man's, interrupts my thought as I hear him standing at my side. Blood is thicker than water, cat. I know, Vlad, better than you. You're expecting too much. 
The Russian won't barter for those who aren't family. The touch of his finger caressing my jaw coils my stomach. I smell him. Too much cologne, but not enough to cover the stench of his body odor. He'll come, Katrina promises. Her hand moves from my jeans once she's secured them as low as they'll go. In one single quick move, my shirt is ripped open. The sound of buttons clinking on the floor comes next. The chilly air in the dank room I'm being kept in creeps along my skin, forcing me to violently shiver. We're supposed to wait for Chiro, the man states, running his finger down my chest, circling my tightened nipple before trailing a soft line down my stomach. He pauses before looping his fingers into the hem of my panties. My baby, I want to cry out. His touch incinerates, insulting my unborn child with his intentions. They can't know I'm pregnant. I won't tell him. Fuck Chiro, Katrina laughs. The old man is a fat fucking coward. Katrina, the man growls. Offering a small relief, he takes his hands from my stomach. We're supposed to stay with her until we're told which one of them to take first. We're supposed to play her. She snaps before my face slams to the side from the force of her fist. The metallic taste of blood fills my mouth. Jiro didn't give that order and you know it, he barks back, wrapping his hand across my forehead and turning it back as it was. Using this information to my advantage, I whimper, please. When no one answers, I beg, please, just let me go. Another punch comes, harder than the first, this time to the gut. The power behind it forces my body to jolt in place as far as my restraints will allow. The skin at my wrists tears open, and shooting pains rip through my shoulders. My legs scream in agony as I rock my body from side to side, testing the boundaries of my movement. I'm calling Vlad. He'll come, and then we'll be finished with this for good. Katrina snaps. We'll be finished with all of them. With a quiet tisk, the man replies, You'd better get to him first, then, or he'll kill us all. A quick and sharp stab to my neck comes before all the pain threats, and finally, the world fades away. 42. Vlad The abandoned warehouse Katrina baited me to find sits along an open road not far from my cabin. The area surrounding the dilapidated black-painted building is wooded, and there is very little light we're able to use to our advantage. Several windows in the front, once painted black as well, are left hanging from being broken. The lack of glass fallen to the ground attests to how long it's been this way. Seven or eight older model cars which look to have been parked in their spots for decades line the side of the yard. As irrational as it is, with the chill in the air, my first thought is to concern myself if Clara has been kept warm. Which leads to my next thought, going to how cold I'll ensure Katrina's death for taking her will be. You've never killed a woman, Abram states, keeping his gaze to the dark road ahead. I may as well have killed Clara's mother. Doesn't count, he denies. You... Personally, I've never killed a woman. I haven't, I reply. But if Katrina does have Clara, as she says, I'll be creative in torturing and then killing my first. Ignoring my last comment, Abram questions, Suppose it's too much to hope that Faina is in there as well. After I hung up the phone with Katrina, I turned to Abram and Gleb. The expressions on their faces were venomous and bloodthirsty. Ruan looked fiercer than I'd ever seen him. His young soul vanished as I explained where my beautiful girl could be. No, my sister isn't here. Katrina wouldn't waste her energy on Faina. She despises her. This isn't about her, Abram. Katrina took Clara for one reason. She wants to get to me. During her phone call to me, Katrina made it clear that in exchange for my dismissing her from my life as violently as I did, Clara would be used to serve as my penance. She informed me that so far, Clara hadn't been harmed. However, if I didn't make it to where she held her in time, 
the woman I love would be fed to the same savage men to whom Katrina paid a high price to take her. No way Katrina did this alone, Vlad, Abram notes. We're walking into a trap. Then it's a trap she set for herself. Gleb is taking Ruan and the others through the woods and back. He'll do as you've asked, but we've got to be careful. We're going in blind. We don't know how much reinforcement Katrina brought with her. The others, except for Stefan. He'd been checking the outside perimeter, just as he'd been trained to do after he saw the girls inside the house. He was found with a gunshot to the chest. The intruders were stupid enough to presume he was dead. I'm thankful for their stupidity as the hospital doctors have reported that Stefan will eventually be okay. Gleb and the others will do whatever it takes, I assure him. Gleb's clear on the plan. He'll die for Clara if he has to. I've never been so certain of my men's loyalty. Taking one of our own is a stupid act against our family, but taking an innocent woman who belongs to us is absolute suicide. Pulling up next to the warehouse, Abram kills the lights and shuts off the engine. We need to wait until we know Gleb's in place, Abram advises. Looking at his watch, he adds, He should be ready any minute. We're ready, I confirm. The boys know what they're doing. If something happens, we move to Plan B. Plan B, I question. We don't have a Plan B. We don't yet, he returns. But if plan A doesn't go as it's supposed to, go with whatever I find to come up with. Fuck, I mutter to myself. At the same time, the bright light behind the warehouse shines once, announcing our arrival. Abram turns to me and smirks. And there's our boy now. Then let's move. Before I'm able to step out of the SUV, Abram reaches over to grab my shoulder. I don't want his prayers, not yet. I shrug from his grasp and he sighs. Walking with hasty steps, I make it to the wooden double doors first, which have been left slightly open. Abram removes his gun from the holster and clears the way. When the door opens wide, followed by a loud creaking sound, we're not met with any resistance. Abram moves inside. A bright light coming from down a small corridor shines toward us. Clara's cry of pain bounces off the walls. Abram gives me an affirming nod and then puts his hand to my chest, signaling me to stay behind him. He takes one step, then two in her direction. A man I've never seen before stands over Clara staring down at her battered and bloodied face. It takes all my energy to remain calm and collected in the wake of what's already been done. But knowing Katrina's death will release all my pent-up fury, I use this to motivate me into doing what I need to do. When the man looks up, his mouth falls open. I told you he'd come. The cat-like smile that follows Katrina's ridiculous assumption is telling. This woman is not only as stupid as I once thought, but she's also not as harmless. Katrina is standing near a window, looking out into the back of the warehouse where I know my men to be. It's true that I brought a small army, if for no other reason than to ensure every single backup plan Katrina put in place would fail. I'm here, I state the obvious. Now you'll tell me what you want. Then I'm taking Clara home. Home, she mocks. She's not going anywhere with you again. Katrina, I call, my tone sounding bored, but my heart heavy. What the fuck do you want? What do I want? She sneers, turning in place to look back outside. I want you to call off your dogs. Gleb is hiding behind a tree. He hides no better than a ten-year-old about to lose a game of hide-and-seek. Gleb is playing to the plan. I'll leave him exactly where he is. Katrina, I snap, 
and her eyes jumped to mine. Why am I here? You're here because I love you. We're going to be together. Bet shit crazy, Abram voices low. Katrina, we're not going to be together, I say calmly. Now stop this before it's too late. It's already too late, my love, she responds, turning her gaze outside once again. Chira will be angry at what I've done. He'll be livid, the man standing near Clara states. Fucking hell. I wanted to give you another chance, Katrina pouts. A motion from the window captures our attention. Gleb's face, already broken and bloody, comes into view. His mouth is gagged, and his eyes are closed. He's been caught, just as he was supposed to be. Well, there's that, Katrina chides, motioning through the window to inform the man holding him to bring Gleb inside. The man wearing a mask holds up a finger. I assumed a signal that Gleb was working alone. Perfect. None of the others have been seen. You've got him, I assert. You've captured the only man I brought with me. Now what? Was I only worth one man? She smiles, points to Abram, and adds, One or two? You're worth as many as will put you down, I tell her, tiring of her game. Now talk. Tell me what you want to do now. We play roulette. You like to gamble, don't you, Vlad? She questions sardonically. Tell me who goes first. She's insane, Abram mumbles, keeping his gun trained on the man hovering over Clara. If he makes a move on her, Abram will kill him if it's the last thing on this earth he does. Insane? Katrina laughs. No, Abram. To fuck Chiro Pileshi, a woman has to be lucid. The old man doesn't know what he's doing. I had to show him his way around a woman. Not like your friend here. She points to me, scanning my body up and down. From behind us, Gleb and another of Katrina's men enter. Gleb's eyes come to mine as blood drips from his openly split eye and swollen nose. He gives nothing away as far as count of men outside, which means there aren't any more. This is a standard practice we've used in the past, and will serve us well here. If there had been an army of any size, Gleb would have fought against his enemy harder. He would have allowed the others to beat him further before he surrendered. If there had been more count of Katrina's men than ours, Gleb would be unconscious. This is good. Clara, I'm here, I call. When a small whimper escapes Clara, the man above her looks up at me. This time he pales. Shut her up, Katrina snaps, then turns to smile at me. And do it slowly. The man shakes his head, refusing to do Katrina's bidding. Do it, she screams. In the midst of her calming anger, Katrina loses focus revealing just how insane she truly is. Pulling a gun from a splintered cabinet at her side, she aims it at the man in question. The gun blasts, just missing Clara. She releases a blood-curdling cry for help. Her eyes are covered with a black blindfold. As her head thrashes back and forth, her blood adheres to her hair with every turn. The man doesn't so much as flinch but the look on his face is venomous. Katrina, steadily aiming the gun at her accomplice, states, Keegan, if you don't shut her up, it'll be you crying out next. Fuck you, he clips, his eyes coming to mine after surveying the damage Katrina did behind him. This wasn't the plan, Zaleski. I swear it. This isn't what we were ordered to do, he confesses tightly, looking between Abram and me. Ordered. Katrina isn't the one in charge. This I had assumed but couldn't prove. Until now. What was the order? 
Abram calmly questions, gripping his handgun harder. Were you supposed to what? Hurt her? Rape her? Kill her? Chiro said. The man stops, looks to Katrina, then down at Clara. We're not on the same team here, Keegan, Abram admonishes, pulling back the trigger of his gun. If you want out of here so badly, say the word. I'll put my bullet in you before that bitch has a chance to use hers. Either way, you're a dead man. The only question is whether you're wearing a scar on your stomach before or after you take your last breath. Gleb coughs a laugh, another signal to keep moving forward. The punch to his gut doubles him over, spitting blood from his mouth onto the concrete floor. All of this means Ruan has had time to get in place. Understanding Gleb's signal, Abram turns in my direction, wearing an expression of worry. Neither of us is anywhere near as close to Clara as we should be. My men are in position, ready to storm the warehouse, and we're still across the fucking room. I'll give you Vlad, Abram states to my surprise. If you want him, he's yours. What the fuck, I clip, turning to him and bowling my fists. The gun he holds is now aimed directly at my chest. Instinct and anger fire like burning hot cylinders in my head. I lift my arms up and surrender. Abram knows the gun taped behind my neck is ready and loaded. Yet my best friend continues with his negotiation, as if he doesn't care or remember. Fucking hell. This is plan B. Katrina! He pushes, keeping his eyes to mine. I've wanted Clara for myself for fucking years, he spits. Give her to me, and I'll give you Vled. You're lying, Katrina counters. I'm not. I've watched Clara as she grew up. She's young and beautiful in all the right parts. Astonished, Katrina seeks clarification. You want this little one? I want the girl, Abram sneers as he continues facing me. I want Clara for myself. I won't give her to you, Katrina sneers. I'll tell you where Faina is. You can have her, but I get Vlad. Fuck Faina, Abram snaps, finally turning his attention toward the woman still aiming her gun at Keegan. That woman is as good as dead. You're right. Katrina assuredly bids. She is as good as dead. Anger, rage, vengeance. The words and their meaning echo in my mind, and my bold fists begin to shake. Hearing what Katrina's clearly stated, Abram turns the gun from me and sends a bullet straight into Katrina's right shoulder. She goes down, clutching it tightly and wailing in pain. Katrina's head slams against the wall on the way down, but her eyes never once leave mine. Abram's signal to the others has been heard. The room goes black. Once the electricity is cut, booted feet smash through the open door behind me, just as I start to push my way across the room. Keegan puts up little struggle against the others, as if coming to terms with what Abram already told him. Katrina's screaming curses are abruptly muted. We're clear, boss, Ruan assures, shining the light on the path to Clara. You head out to the truck in case there's more coming. I'll grab Clara, he insists. Turning in place, I glare and return. No one touches her. No one touches her, Ruan repeats the order to those still in the room. Be quick, and we'll wait for you both outside. 43. Clara. Focus, Vlad. Clara's here. She's alive. She needs rest. You heard what the doctor said. It'll take time, but they're both going to be okay. Abram attempts to reason. Wake up, Clara. I silently coach myself again and again. You have to talk to him. Keep him calm. If you don't, what happened to them is my fault. Vlad tersely returns. Faina, where is she? Why isn't she here? There are other hushed voices in the room. Machines are beeping, items being shuffled around or moved. 
Everything smells sterile, clean. Other voices I can't make out. None of them are Faina. If she was okay, she'd be here. She'd hold my hand like she did when I was younger, tired or sick. My head is pounding and I want to open my eyes. I try, but soon give up as the pain keeps me still. Abram said we're both going to be okay. Does Vlad know about the baby? You'll find Faina first. Katrina Marks isn't going anywhere for a while. Vlad directs, his voice a shallow mix of anger but also fear, an emotion I don't think he's ever had reason to truly know. Katrina hasn't told us anything yet. Ruan replies. At the sound of his young, sweet voice, raspy with concern, I try again to open my eyes, but I'm still so tired. Abram's underground contacts are in play. He set out a reward. Anyone who is anyone in this city is looking for her. We'll find her. The voice I know as Leonid carefully adds. The touch to my hand startles me, rousing me with assaulting memories. She goes to the warehouse. My left shoulder faintly screams in agonizing pain, recalling the pain of the blade as Katrina pushed it through my tissue and muscle. Wake up, little one. The right side of my face throbs. Before I'd been blindfolded, I caught a glimpse of the knife Katrina used to mark me. The long blade was sharp and bloody as she lifted it above my head. She was gloating about what she had done. That Russian bastard loves you. My lip aches, angrier and more swollen from the beating the other man gave me just before Vlad entered the warehouse. Clara, I'm here. As Vlad's lips gently rest against my forehead, my eyes finally begin to flutter open. Once I'm able to focus, I note that he's exhausted. His face is pale and gaunt. The bags beneath his eyes are heavy. He's wearing a dirty black T-shirt and a frown. His hair is disheveled, and his lips are drawn tight. I'm in the hospital. The walls are white, cords hanging from the walls. I've never been in a hospital bed. Irrationally, I wonder if I'll ever make it out. My beautiful girl. Vlad brokenly whispers. I turn my eyes to him and find he's grimacing. Faina, I call, barely able to hear my own whisper. Where is she? She'll be here soon. He easily commits to the lie. I know he's lying because if Faina were able, she'd already be with me. The baby? I question next. Vlad nods to the others, to whom I don't give my attention. Booted feet scuff the floor on their way out, but a hand reaches out to my arm and squeezes tightly. Abram. He looks as lost and alone as Vlad. He also looks so full of regret. Sweetheart, you're safe. I'm sorry I wasn't there to get you sooner. My lip splits, giving my memories a chance to attack. I blink, and a single tear runs down my cheek. Not from the pain, but from all that's happened. I wanted time alone with Faina. I wanted to ensure she was happy with my decision to be with Vlad. I wanted a chance to tell her she was going to be an aunt again without any outside distractions. And now... Abram, go. Vlad insists... I'll deal with all that needs to be done here and take Clara home. Okay, Abram mutters, his eyes moving from Vlad's to mine. In them, I find fear for Faina. When I move to interrupt, Vlad stands. As he adjusts the pillows and blankets from the bed, Abram turns to leave. More than likely, he's silently praying for Vlad, his sister, the woman he loves, and their unborn baby. Where are you, Faina? 44. Abram Abram stands alone, hovering helplessly over the lifeless body of a once vibrant, carefree, and beautiful woman he can't yet bring himself to touch. We're too late. Terribly saddened by the loss this world has suffered with her no longer in it, he's also seething at the violent way in which she was taken. From here, there's no way to tell which torturous act against her finally ended her life. 
The blow to the head, the knife wound not visible due to all the damage she accrued, or simply her broken spirit. Faina's hair is matted with dried blood, her face almost unrecognizable. Her fingers, mostly broken or ripped from their sockets, are covered with dirt. She fought her killer hard, if the skin and grime beneath the fingernails she has left tell the story for her. Faina may have suffered before her death, but just like in life, she didn't go down without a fight. Her tattered clothes hang from her body. Her once soft white shirt is torn at every button. Her black skirt, now soaking in her own blood, has been ripped at the seam, exposing her for all the world to see. Her inner thighs are heavily bruised, likely caused by the punishing blows of a man or several men taking her over and over, again and again. Faina Zaleski wasn't only beaten. Before surrendering to her fate, she'd been brutally raped as well. Abram swallows the bile in his throat as he breathes in the stench of sewage and death that plague the back alley where his informant told him she'd be. By the time he got the call, three days after Clara had been saved, the man who contacted Abram explained without a doubt that Faina was gone. Seventy-two hours of nothing from anyone has led them to this. Abram and his men didn't have to look for her long. When a man as powerful as Vlad issues an order regarding the whereabouts of one of his own, especially a woman in one of his relation, the lowly members of the city's society don't scurry to get away. They panic, offering their help and hoping for the best. As they rescued Clara, who wasn't unharmed but was physically safe, Abram felt false hope. He foolishly believed that Faina's fate would be the same that he'd be bringing her home to her family as soon as she was found. Back to Vlad and Veni. Back to a broken but still alive Clara and the baby. He foolishly wanted to believe that Chiro Pileshi hadn't stepped over the moral line in the most malicious and cruelest of ways. Women in this family are considered sacred. They carry their children. They offer their men a safe escape from all this life expects of them. Bending to his knees, Abram reaches down toward Faina's blank, open, and very dead eyes. He touches her cold lids, closing them for the last time, and saying a prayer in her favor. He wonders how long she endured this cold, wet ground, praying for God to take her to his heaven where she rightfully belongs. I won't ever understand this, he pleads to the God he's always believed in. The same god he well knows Vlad doesn't. Fuck! Ruan slips, losing his composure and bending to vomit, just as Abram wished he could do. Not Faina, Gleb utters at Abram's side, tears already marking his dark eyes. This will kill Vlad. Clara is safe, Abram states. She's been hurt, but she's alive. That's something. Ruan stands, wiping his mouth and holding his stomach. Gleb pats his back, ever the supportive and caring model to the family's youngest soldier. Abram releases himself of the gruesome details in front of him, remembering not this broken-bodied woman lying at his feet, but the once beautiful woman he always admired for her character, strength, devotion, and love. He'll need us. The revenge he'll want for this will be more than any of us can fathom, Gleb comments, now standing between Abram and Ruan. As Abram lifts his head toward the sky, Ruan suggests, We should break Vlad's orders and contact Killian Dawson. Beyond his character, Gleb adds, Killian understands loss at the hands of Chiro. Maybe now... After all this, the old man will agree to bring our families together. I don't know, Abram whispers to himself. The notion is risky. Bringing Killian, a rightful mob adversary, into the home of a man whose life is sure to be pulled out from under him, 
could end in more bloodshed. Right now, we can help by dealing with this. I've already called the cops. It'll be a while before he can bring her home, Gleb states, slapping Abram on the arm. Abram looks around the area, scanning for anyone who'd be stupid enough to linger. Before turning to walk with the others, he takes one last look at Faina's dead body. Our angel is already home. 45. Vled. Boss? Ruan cautiously addresses, his voice coming from the door of my study. I don't look up to acknowledge him. There's someone here to see you. Who is it, I question. Concentrating on the picture Clara had insisted I have on my desk as I take another drink of scotch. The photo is another one taken by the man Osif had sent before all this began. In its center, Clara and Faina are standing in an open parking lot, talking as they load their bags into Faina's black Range Rover. Clara's smiling, Faina's laughing. The two are always happy when they're together. The only person missing between them is Vanny. With or without me, all of those I love are a family in their own right. With no word from my sister or anyone who could tell me where she is, I've relied on the crutch of alcohol to hold my temper in check. The stench of death surrounds me, though, no matter how much I try to drown it away. Ruan, I charge as he says nothing. When I meet his gaze, he swallows hard. I falter from saying more and take a better look at him. My youngest soldier's eyes are thick with burden, his posture weak with sadness. Ruan's hands are fisted at his sides. As if he doesn't know what to do with himself, he stands alone, wordlessly urging me to answer what I think I already knew. Faina has been found. Placing the picture on my desk, I stand. Coming up from behind a stoic Ruan is Abram. The expression not on his face but in his eyes gives me all the confirmation I need. My beautiful, sweet, adoring little sister is never coming home again. Say it, I urge. If I hear the words, maybe the ache in my chest will stop. Tell me. If it's confirmed, maybe my ability to breathe will come back. Where is she? If Abram, my closest friend, utters the deplorable truth I don't want but need to hear, maybe my doubt that she's still alive will turn to unbridled fury, and I can press forward and plan my revenge against those responsible. She's gone. Abram finally murmurs, looking down and sliding his hands in his front pockets. Clearing his throat, he repeats, Vled, my friend, Vaina is dead. Unadulterated sadness. The glass in my hand shatters against the wall before landing in scuttled fragments on the floor. My sister is gone, taken from our lives. Because of me, she'll never experience the true happiness in life that she always deserved. I know where Vinyamin is. I usually do. Faina's voice whispers from a distance. My son, a boy who loved his aunt as if she were his mother, will never understand why this happened. Absolute rage soon follows sadness. The items on my desk become airborne as I bend to sweep them from my view. My life has been spent chained to this room. Every calculated move I've made, each step with caution taken, has been only to assure my family's safety. Clara is incredibly bright and even more beautiful. My beautiful girl. The last person to see Faina alive will be haunted by what's happened for the rest of her life. No amount of reassurance will ever make her feel as safe as she once did. 
If you'd take the time to get to know anyone outside your gang of monstrous men. My men, those who dedicated their lives to protect her, will no longer know the taste of true friendship my sister gave them. Vengeance seeps into every pore of my body. I thought you handled him. How is it possible he's back for more? Faina asked me that months ago, and at the time I was so certain no harm could come to those I loved. Because of this, my enemies will pay. Those responsible for her death will pay ten times over with their own. God, brother, will either of us ever be free? Yes, Faina. You're finally free. Vled, you need... Abram starts to speak but stops, turning his head to Ruan still standing at his side. How did...